This is the place where NFL legends live on and share their story. This is the place for our Spotlight on the Positive segment, sharing what's good in the world of sports. This is also the place for the NFL Alumni Association and the Gridiron Great. This place I speak of, Thursday Night Tailgate. Let's say hello to your hosts, Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Guys, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming back and joining us tonight here on episode number 301 of Thursday Night Tailgate, your home for interviews and insights from some of the greatest players in the history of the game. Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari here to hopefully brighten up the next couple of hours for you. TNT, you know we are brought to you by the great folks over at Kyvan Foods, the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory, the Salt Creek Golf Retreat up in beautiful Nashville, Indiana, our friends over at Tops, plus our partners at the NFL Alumni Association and Mike Ditka's organization, the Gridiron Greats, who we really love. Check them out online at gridirongreats.org. Tonight, Bob and I, we're going to go around the league with uh, some old friends, some new ones as well. First up, we're going to be joined by former Redskins and Vikings Pro Bowl quarterback Gus Farratt. Following Gus, former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins, he'll be here in his regular weekly time slot. About 45 minutes from now, we're going to get a return visit from former Notre Dame and Steelers quarterback Terry Hanready. Had a great time with Terry last year, so looking forward to catching up with him. We'll kick off hour number two with a uh, visit from former uh, Eagles and Colts nose tackle Harvey Armstrong. I had the privilege of spending some time with Harvey and his wife at the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony this year back in May when our mutual friend Jeff Harrod, TNT Hall of Famer as well, uh, was inducted there. So we're uh, really looking forward to catching up with Harvey about an hour from now. And then we'll round out tonight's show with a visit uh, from uh, former Bucks defensive end Walter Carter. Walter is uh, dealing with long-term effects from concussions that he suffered during the course of his playing career. He played at FSU, and on top of uh, playing for the Bucks, he also played for the Tampa Bay Bandits. So uh, we'll get his perspective about 90 minutes from now. So we got a lot of great guests in store for you tonight. We can't thank you enough for tuning in and taking the journey with Bob and I over the next couple of hours, but uh, we'll kick things off by bringing in my co-host, Mr. Lazari. Bob, how are you tonight, my friend? I'm um, okay, Chris. How about yourself? Ah, pretty nice. You know, actually, uh, Bob, it, uh, it's been a pretty good week so far. And, uh, you know, as I uh, think about, uh, you know, we, as we had our, our, our 300th episode in the celebration last week, which was uh, fantastic, a great time, big milestone for you and me in the show. And we'll look ahead here. And uh, not all that long from now, we'll be celebrating our sixth anniversary special. And, We'll be announcing who our uh, TNT Guest Hall of Famers are, uh, you know, this year coming up here over the next couple of weeks. So it's been a good week. It was a great week last week. Looking ahead to the sixth anniversary special, we got some great guests tonight. It's all in all, it's been a pretty good day, my friend. How about you? Good to hear. Good to hear. Pretty good. Busy as usual and uh, staying active and doing what I can, you know, to to beat Father Time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who do uh, who do you uh, have coming up on your on the TV side uh, with our good friend Tony D'Angelo and your show Monday Night Sports Talk? This coming Monday, Chris, we're going to be talking to former Major League infielder Jack Perconti. He's been on the show before. It's been a couple of years since we spoke with him, but very interested interesting guy, Chris, because not only was he a very very good utility guy, but he uh, has his own baseball school now, has written a book, uh, is into um, instruction now big time and uh, a lot of fundamental stuff and uh, both on and off the field. It's going to be interesting catching up with him. But, yeah, Jack Perconti, really good guy. Let uh, let our listeners know, how can they uh, how can they listen to the show, find you guys both on your YouTube channel and, uh, and stream the show as well? I think the website, Chris, is mondaynightsports.net. And go to YouTube is your best uh, shot. That's Monday Night Sports 14, all one word. That channel has tons of the past interviews we've done uh, with many, many pro athletes. And uh, so it's your best bet. Uh, and enjoy. It's it's a lot of good stuff there. Yes, it is. A lot of great guests. And a lot of, you know, we've had some crossover between this show and, and your show. So, yeah, you guys have a, a fantastic library of shows. Highly recommend it. It's time for a 
another edition of Bob's Take. So, Bob, tell us, what's on your mind tonight? Yeah, let's get into this week's Bob's Take segment. And, Bob, the first thing I want to get your thoughts on tonight are the trades that uh, were made a few days ago by our good friend Angelo Kane's Bills. You know, uh, a lot of guys, a lot of folks looking forward to uh, this season in Buffalo and had some high hopes. Can want to get your thoughts? They traded away former first round pick Sammy Watkins and a uh, and a 2018 six round pick uh, to the Rams in exchange. They got cornerback EJ Gaines and a uh, 2018 second round pick, and then they traded defensive back Ron, Ronald Darby to the Eagles in exchange for wide receiver Jordan Matthews and a third round pick. Plus, last week, Bob, they signed free agent wide receiver Anquan Bolden. So, Bob, the Bills now have two picks in each of the first three rounds in next year's draft. But, you know, gone are perhaps, you know, one of their best offensive weapons and uh, one of the best defensive players, albeit, you know, Sammy Watkins missed a lot of games due to various injuries. So, Bob, your take on where the Bills are. This appears to be a trade to set themselves up for next year. But did they bring in a couple of good wide receivers? And, you know, of course, depending on how much Anquan Bolton has left in the tank, is this good for this year as well? You know, I think overall, Chris, it was a good move for them because it's almost as if they want to give Sean McDermott, they want to rebuild with this guy. And uh, what they did is uh, it's not as if they didn't replace uh, guys that they traded. <clears throat> Matthews uh, is not Watkins, but he's he's got a lot of talent, Chris, and they're just uh, they're wondering if he can put it all together in the next year or two. He's had a history of dropping balls, but uh, <clears throat> very very uh, a good rookie year he had. Uh, I think he was close to 900 yards as a rookie, but uh, has got that big play stuff going on. He's just got to get a little more consistent. Uh, Gaines, they brought him in. Um, as a starter, he'll be fine, Chris. I mean, I think he's going to be pretty good. He's a very, very small man, but uh, very good on his feet. So, uh, I mean, it was you, re- you replaced the two positions, but uh, you hit it on the head when you said about the draft picks. Um, that's going to be something where uh, they're building for the future. I mean, you're going to have high draft picks for a few years uh, there. And uh, so this is, again, uh, they're, I think they, they're looking at it like we can't win this year, but uh, we're going to get competitive. We're going to see if a few guys can step it up, like Matthews and Gaines, and uh, just build with those draft picks. Uh, it, it's obviously what they're doing is they like McDermott, and they're going to build with him and the draft. So uh, this will be interesting. But I think uh, as far as a future type thing, it was a good move by them. Yeah, agreed, Bob. And uh, just on a side note, uh, talking to our good friend uh, Jim Everett, former uh, Rams Pro Bowl quarterback, and he's seen Watkins, you know, over the first couple of days he's been there out in L.A. So, uh, Jim, you know, from a fantasy football perspective, says, you know, hey, Sammy Watkins isn't a uh, a first-round draft pick, but could be a very good sleeper, likes what he's seen from him over the first couple of days with the Rams. So there's a fantasy mm-hmm. football tip. But, yeah, Bob, I think this sets them – Sets them up really good for next year with, uh, you know, six picks in the first three rounds. So, uh, whether Bolden has anything left and what we, you know, what we see from the other guys that they brought in, Jordan Matthews is a, uh, is a nice wide receiver. He's not great, but he's a nice wide receiver. He's had, you know, some decent years with the Eagles. So it'll be interesting to see what they put together. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you, Bob. I think that they are certainly building towards a, a really good 2018, 2019. And, Bob, staying in the AFC East, things just keep getting worse, it seems, for the Jets. You know, a little over a week ago, their only wide receiver that had any real experience, uh, Quincy Nunwa, had uh, a season-ending neck injury. He was in surgery, I believe, uh, either today or this week. So that leaves them with Robbie Anderson, Sharon Peake, and Jalen Marshall as their top three wide receivers right now. And all three of those guys you know, are entering their second seasons in the league. They've got a combined 61 receptions for 773 yards and two touchdowns. So, Bob, what's your take? Should the, should the Jets just roll with the young guys? We've talked a little bit about this so far, you know, over the offseason. Should they just roll with those guys to see what they have, you know, for 2018 and beyond? Because it, it feels like they're already dead 
for 2017 and we're just, you know, into, into the beginnings of preseason? Or do you think really they may, maybe they should bring in, you know, there are a couple of free agent wide receivers still sitting out there, Bob, guys like Vincent Jackson, Cecil Shorts had, you know, some good games. Eddie Royal's been a serviceable wide receiver. Those guys are still out there. And then, you know, some veterans will get cut, you know, towards the end of uh, an end of training camp. So your thoughts, roll the dice with the young guys and just look ahead to the future or try to bring in some veterans to, to see what they can do this year. Well, as you said, Chris, there's a few guys out there. You're, you're Vincent Jackson and everything, but I'm looking at it this way. And I, I think the Jets look at it this way also that these guys that you mentioned, their best days are definitely behind them. You would have to have a stud quarterback and bring these guys in to get anything out of them, I think. And, and that's not the case, obviously, in New York, uh, with McCown and, and Hackenberg going at it as far as who might be able to get the ball to these guys. So Chris, I think it's a no brainer. You gotta go with the young guys, this is, you know, as, as much as they kind of deny it, it's, it's kind of a year to see where, you know, who can help you in the future. Uh, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, if they go four and 12, uh, that might be good for some jet fans, but, uh, Anderson, you know, this is a young guy, Chris, he's, he's got some talent. There's no question. I know Chad Johnson, uh, tweeted about him and then said he, He's going to be fine. Just watch him and then remember that I said this in typical Ocho Cinco fashion, right? But that's the, <laughs> what he says. Uh, it, it's just a brutal situation, Chris. When they lost in Unwa, he, uh, he was a very good player here. And, and, and they're really, you got to go with guys, uh, that are, are young at this point. Um, let the quarter, let the young quarterback, if he's Hackenberg, if he's in there, uh, let him get his feet wet with some guys he may be throwing to in the future, right? I mean, it just, it makes sense just to go with this. It's probably not good for Todd Bowles, who is probably right on the bubble as far as if he's going to be coaching past this year, but it's not really fair. But, uh, again, uh, I, I have to say, Chris Anderson and, uh, just see who kind of, uh, would, would emerge. Uh, out of the youngsters, but bringing in a veteran receiver with a quarterback controversy like this, not a, not a good thing. Yeah, and, I, and I'm with you, Bob. I think you roll the dice, you see what you got, and uh, set yourself up for the future. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't I don't see the value. You know, hey, maybe bring in one of those guys as a mentor, tutor, or something like that. You know, a guy that you know you might throw out there for you know a couple of plays a game, but uh, can help bring these guys along. Yeah, I could see that. But uh, yeah, as a you know, hey, we're we're going to bring in you know some of these older veterans and 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 still believe, still try to make our fans believe that we got a shot this year. Yeah, I think that's a lose-lose. And, Bobby, as you mentioned about Todd Bowles, ESPN.com came out with an all-too-soon article, right, talking about which NFL coaches are on the hot seat going into this season. And the top four guys on that list were Bears head coach John Fox, Colts head coach Chuck Pagano, Todd Bowles, and Marvin Lewis. So, Bob, I want, wanted to get your take on the guys, you know, at the top of the list that they that they put out there. You know, like we just said, you know, if you're Todd Bowles, have they really stacked the deck against you based on, you know, the roster that they're giving you right now? So, you know, how how could they possibly blame Todd Bowles for having a bad season? Your take, Bob, on the guys that uh, that they've got on the top of this list. He's the guy that stands out, Chris, because you're right. He has probably the worst roster in the NFL, and they're telling him, well, I don't know if they're going to tell him to win, Chris. This is one of those deals where if somehow, if somehow Todd Bowles got this uh this team to six and ten which would be uh, almost miraculous they might say wow this guy is a very very good coach and he might be the way uh you know a younger guy to go go that way in the future with him but i think at this point it's it's the point right now where they're at balls they're saying Man, you know, he hasn't, uh, he, he's a 500 coach in two years, uh, kind of a known for a defensive type minded coach. They're going to be looking at him very close, Chris. This is to see if these, if these guys play for him, they don't quit because it's not going to be pretty. Trust me, but it's to see if he can coach guys that aren't as talented as the rest of the league, but don't quit on this guy. And if that's the case, if they could surround him with better players in the future, he might be the answer. But I think this is re- he's on the bubble big time. Uh if they tank 2 and 14 and guys start quitting and you hear a lot of stuff in New York, it's not it it's, it gets ugly quickly. That's the thing. So I think Bowles is right at the top of the list there as far as guys on the uh 
on the bubble and John Fox comes to mind too. I, I couldn't believe it when I read, I knew he wasn't doing well, but when you read it, it just, it blows your mind that he's nine and 23 since getting to Chicago. This is a guy that took two teams to Super Bowls and has won a lot of games, Chris, but uh, Chicago, you know, the, they, they just can't deal with that kind of stuff in that division and everything with the competitiveness and everything. Uh, but this guy, nine and 23 in Chicago, if they don't do something major this year, he's gone. That's that's a no-brainer. Yeah, and I and I agree, Bob, on on both counts. It's uh, it's going to be tough, you know. For but I, you know, I feel badly for both of those guys, both you know Todd Bowles, you know, and John Fox. You know, they've got young teams, young quarterback, right? We can see what uh, Mitch Trubisky is is going to be able to do. Uh, you know, I just uh, I feel badly for both guys because I think you know that they they're sort of you know well certainly Todd Bowles is starting all over, right? We've we certainly said enough about that. But I think John Fox, you know, they've they've jettisoned a bunch of the you know the talent that they had on offense and now they're, you know, starting, you know, really starting over, you know, on that side of the ball, the defense is progressing really nicely, which you would expect from John Fox. He's a defensive minded head coach, mm-hmm. but they got to build that offense. I, you know, I just, when you, when you've got, you know, a fresh start, if you will, because you're going with a young quarterback, you're going with young wide receivers to think you could be on the hot seat, you know, uh, that's tough. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this season pans out and, uh, and where these coaches go from here. And there you have it, folks. That is Bob's take for this week. We've got our first guest, Gus Farad, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Gus here in just a moment. Folks, you know TNT, we are sponsored by Kyvan Foods. NFL star Reggie Kelly brings the authentic flavor of traditional Southern cooking to market with his Kyvan Foods products. Made with the finest ingredients, Kyvan Foods invites you to appreciate the goodness of the exceptional flavors in their salsas, their sauces, their apple butter, and their other fine products as well. Make Kyvan items a part of your tailgating spread, whether you're at the game or you're at home home gating with your friends and your family. The taste is unbelievable. It's available through Walmart.com and at select Kroger stores. Or you can order order online from Amazon or at Kyvan's website itself at Kyvan82.com. And Kyvan is spelled K-Y-V-A-N. Baseball season, right? We're churning towards the postseason. And if you love the game, folks, you've got to go check out the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory. They were inducted into the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence Hall of Fame. The museum is a very cool experience for everybody in your family because you get to go in there and walk their live production line and see some of the 1.8 million bats that they make every year, and they've been doing it now for 132 years. Don't miss the Bat Vault where you can go in and actually hold game-used bats from so many of the game's greatest legends. Guys like Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, my hero growing up, Willie Stargell. To find out more information about the museum and to book your visit, go to sluggermuseum.com. We are also proud to be sponsored by our good friend and TNT Hall of Famer, Randy Manier, and the great folks up at the Salt Creek Golf Retreat in Nashville, Indiana, which was Nashville, Indiana, oh, by the way, was voted one of the top 20 small towns in the country by Smithsonian Magazine. Let's hear a word from our announcer, Joe Lajanusa, about all the great things going on up there. If you're looking for a great place for your annual golf outing, a weekend golf getaway, or just a round of golf with your buddy, then Salt Creek Golf Retreat is just what you're looking for. Centrally located in Nashville, Indiana, just south of Indianapolis and west of Cincinnati, this challenging but fair 18-hole golf course appeals to all skill levels, and its scenic views of rolling hills and tree-lined fairways are sure to make golfing memories for years to come. Owned and operated by former Purdue and New York Giants fullback Randy Manier, Salt Creek Golf Retreat offers stay and play packages that include golf and a fully furnished one or two bedroom condo. After your round, be sure to stop by the 19th Hole Sports Bar and Restaurant for great food, fun, and drinks. Randy and his staff will treat you like family. For more information, log on to saltcreekgolf.com. That's saltcreekgolf.com. Or give them a call at 812-558-5944. Salt Creek Golf Retreat. Start making your golfing memories today. Yeah, we can't say enough great things about the golf course, the condos, and Randy staff as well. They're all so fantastic. Go online to saltcreekgolf.com to see for yourself how great a place it really is. 
All right, now joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is former Pro Bowl quarterback Gus Farratt. Let me give you some background on Gus. He's from Catanning, Pennsylvania, which is 44 miles northeast of my hometown of Pittsburgh along the Allegheny River. In high school, he lettered in football, baseball, and basketball, played his college ball at Tulsa, where he remains sixth in all-time passing yards and ninth in touchdown passes. His nearly 3,000 yards passing his senior season were the most by a Tulsa quarterback in nearly three decades. He was a seventh-round draft pick in 1994 by the Washington Redskins, and he played in the NFL from 94 to 2008 for the Redskins, Lions, Broncos, Bengals, Vikings, Dolphins, and Rams. Over the course of his NFL career, he threw for just over 21,000 yards and 114 touchdowns. He was named to the Pro Bowl in 1996 when he threw for nearly 3,500 yards under North Turner and led the Redskins to their first winning season in the post-Joe Gibbs era. And we are glad to have Gus with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Gus, Chris, and Bob, thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, Gus. Yeah, hi, fellas. Thanks for having me on. So, Gus, I wanted to start by going back to your time in college. As a guy from right to, right outside of Pittsburgh, how did Pitt miss out on having you play there versus uh, you ending up at Tulsa? You know, it's funny. I never got recruited by Pitt. I got recruited by Penn State to play linebacker, which everybody gets recruited by Penn State to play linebacker. Uh, <laughs> we had a coach who, who actually went to Penn State. He was the offensive line coach. Uh, his name was Mark Thomas. He coached at Tulsa. And he recruited our area very heavily, and I graduated with with many, many guys from Western Pennsylvania at the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma. So it was a great experience. It was a home away from home because of so many people there, and it was a great experience for me. And guess as I was sort of looking back over your, you know, your college game stats, you know, your first start it looked like, you know, came after uh, TJ Rubley got hurt, and you faced Oklahoma, sort of a welcome to college football, son. So, you know, here here you go up against one of the top uh, football programs in the country. What was that like for you? Um, I'm sure my eyes were pretty big at that point. Um, you know, that coming in, I can remember when he got hurt and I came in against Arkansas and played. And then, you know, you're playing against these big teams and you come from a small school like uh, Fort City High School in, in Pennsylvania, like you said, outside of Pittsburgh. And my senior year, we had 19 kids on my team. So, that was a big change for me, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to throw the ball around a lot. Coach Raider did an outstanding job. I think we ran a spread before the spread was popular and um, just really enjoyed my time there. And, you know, I had a real surreal moment this summer. I was coaching at the Hall of Fame Academy uh, over in Canton this summer and coaching a couple quarterbacks. And the one kid I recognized the name, I said, your dad isn't TJ. He said, yeah, my dad's T.J. Rubley, and uh, so I was coaching T.J.'s son at the Hall of Fame wow. Academy this summer. So it was, it was it was all a surreal moment, brought everything back really fast. Yeah, so after a couple of seasons, uh, you know, backing him up, you, you got your chance to start, and then in, in 93, you really took off. You threw for almost 3,000 yards, 21 touchdowns. You and Chris Penn seemed to kind of, you know, kind of match up really well, became a tremendous duo. What made the two of you guys so successful together? You know what? He he just was relentless, and uh, he ran excellent routes, and he understood the game. We could put him in any position. We moved him all around the field to get the best matchups, and, uh, you know, I threw every route possible to him, and I was blessed with the strong arm, and he was blessed with the God-given ability to catch my passes that were all over the place. And um, so we just, you know, we just had a good relationship. Chris was a quiet, hardworking kid and just love football just like I did. And, and we just had a connection um, out on the field that, you know, you kind of football players have sometimes, and it was a lot of fun. Bob, questions for Gus? Hi, Gus. So you, you just mentioned about your uh, being recruited as a linebacker, and you were one of those very early big quarterbacks, Gus, and, and now they seem to be all – your size coming up, a lot of them anyway. But uh, tell me more about uh, you playing linebacker in high school. Did you have that kind of size back then? And uh, when did you make – well, you probably went both ways, I would imagine. Well, you know what's funny, uh, Bob, is that in ninth grade, I, I, I played in eighth grade. That was the first time I ever played football. In ninth grade, I came out, was going through the preseason, and I tackled somebody with my head down and broke my neck. And okay. um, I crushed the fourth vertebrae. And I didn't play football for two years. So my junior year, I started to play again. 
um, and was playing some safety and, and some uh, cornerback and was really kind of careful what I was doing my senior year was much more aggressive on defense. I was a, you know, I was a big kid and, and I was, I was six, four, 205 pounds. And, and, uh, you know, like I tell kids all the time, if, if you have the size, teams will take a chance on you because that's one thing they can't coach. They can't coach you to be bigger. Uh, and so I was blessed with that and I was lucky enough to, to overcome some injuries. And I just did not, you know, once I started playing quarterback, I loved it. I could throw it. And, uh, that's what I really wanted to do. So, that made my mind up of, you know, not really wanting to go to Penn State, but somewhere that they wanted me to play quarterback and throw the football. And, Gus, when you arrived in Washington, your first NFL coach, North Turner, uh, has always had that offensive guru moniker to him. Uh, tell me more about his system, how you got along with him, and uh, was the system difficult to master? Um, I thought it was a great system. That's still my favorite system. After playing 15 years in the NFL, seven different teams and a ton of different coordinators, being in the West Coast, the digit and hybrids of all those, um, I still love Coach Turner's the best. I love the digit system for its simplicity, understanding it, the route tree. Um, you know, when, if you're getting a safety blitz, somebody's got to adjust. And it was really, you know, because the system was big throws, Big 20 plus yard throws, comebacks, you know, posts, those types of things. And, and it was a lot of fun to play in that system. And I, I give Coach Turner a lot of credit. He was great at being able to understand when the defense was going to blitz, when they're playing coverage and all the, and when they're playing man. And we, we ended up calling a lot of the plays correctly. So Coach Turner was a great play caller and I, I really enjoyed my time playing with him. Coach Turner was, you know, he tried to have fun with the, with the guy, with the quarterback and, and make some jokes with us. And, but, you know, there is just coach Turner was just, he was a ball coach. You know, that's what he was. That's what he was good at. And he tried to communicate with us and, uh, we got along the best we could. And Gus, you know, like I mentioned in your intro, you were a seventh round pick in 94 by the Redskins. That was North Turner's first season there as head coach, but. You know, at the top of the draft, they take Heath Shuler, right? Number one in the, or in the, in the first round, third right. overall selection. Were you drafted? Were you, were you happy just to be drafted? Or were you disappointed kind of figuring, boy, this is going to be hard to make this team when they drafted this kid in the first round? Uh, well, gr- growing up where I grew up, um, and being with my family and friends and everybody that was with me during the draft, I really had no idea where I was going to be drafted. I was the fifth quarterback taken overall. But it wasn't until the seventh round. And, uh, you know, I was just happy to be drafted. At that point, I was like, hey, let, let me go somewhere. If not, I'm going to go, be a, you know, and try my best. And, and even though Heath Schuller was drafted number one overall, I went there. I gave him my all. I practiced every day, stayed late, threw more, did whatever I had to do to make the team, was able to do that. And then, you know, with Heath holding out uh, uh, for his contract, it just let me get all the reps and it let me uh, get way ahead of where Heath was. And just, you know, being a quarterback that comes from Western PA and having the toughness, nothing really bothered me and was able to make the throws and, and uh, put the ball, you know, had a lot to learn about the game still and uh, still never figured it out after 15 years. It's a, it's a very inter- intricate game and it's a lot of fun. And, and um, you know, I just, I just really thank the Redskins for drafting me in the seventh round because it was a dream come true. Was there any internal pressure that you were aware of because of where they drafted Schuler and because he was a first round pick to to take him over you, even though you know, it was probably looking like you were going to be the guy and you were, like you said, you got the reps and you were making the throws and all of that sort of thing. But was there any internal pressure to go with Schuler anyway, even because of where he was drafted? Oh, I'm sure there was. I mean, it comes down to money. I mean, that's what the league is a business. It's a game that we love to play, but it's a business for owners and coaches and, and other general managers. And, and, you know, they gave Heath Schuller the money. Uh, they said he had the potential to do this and we're going to invest in him and, and they're going to give him every opportunity to go out and prove himself and which is, which is the right thing to do. And, uh, being an underdog and being that way my whole career, I just had to keep continually proving myself every time I stepped on the football field. And guess as I sort of looked at you know, like your game stats once you got into into the NFL, your second career 300-yard passing game 
came in the last game of the season in 96 and a win at home against the Cowboys. They, you know, not only did it, you know, get you a win, but it got you guys over 500. You end up making, you know, being nine and seven that year. So it was the first winning season in the post Joe Gibbs era. How big was that win for you and for the team? Well, anytime the Redskins beat the Cowboys, it's a big win. So, um, you know, one of my favorite things about Washington was when getting to play the Cowboys at RFK, the bleachers bouncing, you know, the fans, the band, the hogettes, and, and uh, everything else. I mean, those are memories that, that I'll have forever, and it was just an extraordinary experience. And, uh, you know, that just was, you know, for North Turner to, to win nine games that year and for our team to, to come from a, you know, a piecemeal team that was put together in 94 and, and starting to, put the pieces together we felt really good about where we were and and uh, we had some great leadership on that team and just really had a great experience and enjoyed my time that year in 96. Bob a couple more for Gus before we let him go. Sure Gus uh, you mentioned RFK I wanted to ask you more about that I was there once Gus I, I cut my teeth basically following the Redskins teams of 70s 80s Jurgensen and Kilmer and Larry Brown and Monk and it was just incredible and, and some of the guys that have come through there RFK Stadium I think your first three years were spent there you mentioned the hogs and everything and, and when we think of franchises Gus we think of Green Bay and Soldier Field I don't think RFK gets the credit it deserved as far as being one of the uh, old places that was electric uh, talk more about that because that place when it was rocking it was something to behold it really was. It was probably, it still is, and always will be my favorite stadium to ever play in. I've played in all, almost all the stadiums in the NFL, being able to play in on so many different teams. And uh, that stadium, just just the atmosphere and electricity, when you play those rivals, when you would play the Eagles, and then the Cardinals would come in town. I mean, that's back when we still played Arizona. Um, and the Cowboys would come in town. Those games were huge. The town was electric, and uh, the people really enjoyed themselves. And I don't know how many people have ever been to RFK, but when that crowd gets going and, and you see a full <laughs> set of bleachers bomping off the ground, um, it, it just it just gets you fired up to go out and win for your city and win for your team and give it everything you have. And so I'm sure that all those past Redskins that played there um, probably had the same experience and. And, uh, you know, I, I understand why you got to build new stadiums to get more people in and everything, but just mm. that place and the atmosphere and the closed quarters, uh, it was just an outstanding place to play. And finally, Gus, my, one of my favorite players ever was a teammate of yours, Brian Mitchell, and the, only because this guy was probably in history one of the more versatile offensive guys that ever uh, played. Uh, were you amazed at how many things this guy could do, including quarterbacking? Yeah, he could do it all. I mean, I mean, that's, that's what the NFL is. It's special players who go out and prove themselves every week. And, and what was great about Brian, he could prove himself in almost all positions, special teams, receiver, running back, quarterback, you name it. And, uh, that, that guy could do it. B. Mitch was an outstanding player, was a great leader and, uh, was one of the pieces of the puzzle that, that we had that 96 year that really kept us together. And, 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 you know, B. Mitch was a great teammate. And I uh, love playing with him, and and this was an outstanding guy on third down, and and when, whenever you needed him, he was there, and he could do it all, like you said, and, and uh, I could see why he was one of your favorite players. Gus, you're now the VP of Brain Performance Initiatives for a company called RC21X. Talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, I really love what I'm doing now. I retired in '08 and became a high school head coach. I got to coach Ezekiel Elliott in, in high school, so that was an experience. Mm. But then found I wanted to get out, out into the real world a little more and kind of, you know, when you coach high school ball, it's great. You get to change young men's lives, but I was only changing a few at a time. I wanted to do something that I could do all the time and affect a bunch of people. So everybody has a brain. They've been given the greatest system ever created. And uh, with our company, RC21X, We've built a tool that you can play on any mobile device. It's called Roberto. We're named after the great Roberto Clemente uh, because we wanted to name our tool and our company after somebody who did things for other people and helped other people. Roberto died taking aid to um, uh, an earthquake-ravaged uh, country, Nicaragua, and uh, when his plane went down. So 
We're named after him. His son, Roberto Jr., is one of our ambassadors. And we have created a tool that you can monitor your brain performance um, every day if you want, uh, every week. Uh, you can play it on any mobile device, and everybody can go to robertoapp.com and, and check it out and really understand where you are in your life. It doesn't matter. Our tool will, will um, let you get your profile from ages 6 to 106. Uh, there's a 15-day free trial right now when you sign on. So for me as a concerned parent, I wish I would have had it when my kids were playing football. I could have watched their brain performance and seen what was happening in their life. It doesn't matter if it's low sleep. If they uh, have a bad diet, if they're playing sports and they bump their head, or, or even our kids, all of our kids were crazy. They, they climbed trees. They fell out of trees. Anything can happen, and if you can understand what their brain performance is doing, it's something that we've never been able to monitor. And with our app, Roberto, we can monitor your brain performance and let you know where you are and hopefully let you make better decisions and get your life on the right track where you want it to be. Wow, that's fantastic stuff, Gus. Good for you guys. And again, it's robertoapp.com. Gus, let our listeners know how they can stay up to date with uh, all the great things you're doing and follow you over social media. Oh, yeah. I'm on, uh, um, if you go to Victory, uh, you can follow me on, on Twitter at Gus Farratt. I'm also, also with a company out of Toronto called Victory. Uh, they just put a link up to my, uh, I have also have a fan website. And uh, I just did a whole story on my hometown growing up in Fort City, Pennsylvania. They recently closed our high school and combined with another high school and, and went back and did a story on that. And so people can just find me at Gus Farad on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, I'm um, on Instagram. And, uh, you know, just I just like to put everything up and I want everybody to understand their own brains and, and really be able to monitor themselves and make better decisions because we're all peak performers in life. We under, want to understand where our limited resource is, and let's let's go out and, and create a better better you. And that's what we want to do. And so I really appreciate you guys having me on. It's been great to talk about Roberto and RC21X, and uh, you know, and and my career. And I really appreciate you guys having me on iHeartRadio. Ah, uh, we appreciate it very much, Gus. We hope you'll come back and do it again sometime. It's been a great, you know, it's been great having you as part of the show. Yeah, thank you so much. And, um, you know, everybody wants me to sign now is HTTR, so hell to the Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Take care, guys. All the best to you and your family. Take thanks, care. Chris. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Good night. That is uh, former Pro Bowl quarterback Gus Farratt. And, uh, again, their name of the app is RobertoApp.com, named after Roberto Clemente. Fantastic stuff. Great to have him on on this part of the show, Bob. And so much more to get into about, you know, his playing days, you know, particularly in the NFL. Hopefully we get the privilege of having Gus back on the show again real soon. Yeah, terrific guy, Chris. And, again, uh, played for, I believe, seven different franchises, and we can uh, delve into that next time. All right, folks, we've got our next guest, Tony Collins, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Tony on the other other side of this uh, station break. You're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari, where NFL legends live on. Back to you, boys. It's him. He's alive. All right, now back with us on the Kyvan Foods guest line is former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins. Tony, how are you, my friend? We've missed you. Hi, Tony. <laughs> doing fantastic. How you doing, Chris and Bob? <laughs> good. Ah, really good. Thank you, Tony. So, uh, Tony, unfortunately, we start off tonight with with you on a on a sad note. We learned earlier today that former Patriots nose tackle Lester Williams, unfortunately, passed away age 58. He was a part of the Super Bowl team that you played with back in 1985. He was drafted the year after you just wanted to get, you know, some thoughts or memories about Lester. Man, what a, what a great guy. He came in the year after I did. So we were just like, I mean, we were, we were really actually really close uh, while we were playing. Um, just a great guy, defensive tackle come, coming out of Miami. Uh, just a, a, a great, friend that's what he was to me as far as uh we would <laughs> I, I just think about i was thinking about him today me lester ronnie Lipped, and a couple other guys every every away game we would get on the airplane we would play blackjack all the way the whole whole ride on the plane we would play blackjack 
And then when we then when we got to our destination, if if somebody was losing real bad, we we actually had to play blackjack on the bus to the to the to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, man, Lester Lester was a great uh, great 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 guy, great football player too coming out of Miami. Uh, you, you definitely will be missed and uh, really sad to hear that today. Yeah, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, to his family. And Tony, you mentioned playing, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but Robert Kraft bought not one, but two 767 <laughs> airplanes. So the team no longer is going to be flying, you know, that crazy charter plane stuff. They're going to be flying on their own planes, and they're the first team to actually buy their own airplanes. So I'm I'm sure, you know, that uh, these aren't typical, you know, commercial planes that they've got them decked out inside, but kind of wanted to get your your memory. What was it like traveling for you guys on the planes when you were going back and forth? Well, we, we, we had a charter plane. I mean, it wasn't nothing, nothing fancy. We'd have to, you know, go through the checkout and everything, just like the, just like everybody else sitting in the, in the hotel. Uh, but, um, the, the, the thing that, that that doesn't surprise me about Mr. Kraft, uh, be, be, what he's done. And I, I, but I think the other thing, the other whole thing, getting off Mr. Kraft is everybody now. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, and they're like, "Who you guys think you guys are?" Getting getting too getting too jealous. I was like, "We we we all we do is win. We just keep winning. So if, if we keep <laughs> winning, you know, we, we're making more money than anybody else. So we can we can we can afford to do stuff like that." But as those guys are going to be, it's going to be fantastic, man. They're not, they're not going to have to wait. They're not going to have to go through security. They can go right to their plane, and it, it'll be fantastic for for them. I, you know, I think it's I think it's a great deal. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's a hassle sometimes going going through, uh, you know, you know the whole routine routine of uh, you know getting on the plane, getting off the plane, different things like that. But I'm pretty sure it's a lot different than it was when we were back playing because we. You know, we, we chartered and we had to go through the security line and everything else, just like everybody else. But, um, I, I think, I think it's a great thing. I think it's just another, also is, is great for, for all the other, all the other teams. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty surprised that, uh, at once, uh, what's the, what's the owner down in Dallas? I can't think of his name right Jerry now. Jerry Jones. Don't Jones. Yeah. Jerry Jones. I'm pretty sure he's, Planning on getting him a plane pretty soon too. <laughs> no, yeah, you got to keep up, right? So, <laughs> yeah, got to keep up. Five right. questions for Tony. <laughs> Tony, you talk about a hassle. I, I think about the old Schaefer Stadium. Uh, you know, I went up there a couple times back in the day, Tony. We think of Robert Kraft, we think of Gillette, but you played in the old place. And uh, to me, Tony, I mean, it took me five, six hours to get home. It was crazy to get in and out of there. You had that one road. I was wondering how you got to the place. You probably had to take a helicopter to get there well, on game day. But what were your memories, Tony, about the old place uh, in and out? The the traffic is still that bad. It's still on that, that – where they built Gillette Stadium, they tore, they tore down uh, Schaefer, and, yeah. and, 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 and they, they built uh, Gillette right – Right where right where Schaefer was, and now it's it's just like a big man. It's a, well, you've seen it. It's it's a beautiful yeah. place, man. It's got a mall. It's got bowling alley there. It's got it's it's just like a uh you know just like a whole new whole little little town of of Gillette Stadium. It's just like a little town there. But uh you know we we would have to be there at the game. Um, if if, if it was a one o'clock game, we would have to. You know, I usually get there like nine o'clock. So. You know, you, you're not going to run into too much traffic around that time, and so we, you know, we would we would we would get there before the traffic kind of builds up. We would have a little lane where they let the players come through, uh, so we wouldn't have to wor- worry about the uh, that that uh, Route One. That's where that's where the stadium is on, and it's still on Route One now. And if you go to a game now today, it's, it's going to still take you four or five hours to get out of there, depending on you know what what mm-hmm. happens in, with the traffic. So it hasn't changed much as far as getting in and out. But because the stadium is still on that still that that same Route One, uh, going, running through Foxborough. You said arriving very early on game day, Tony. We a, a lot of these guys with their pregame routines. We're seeing a lot of guys now. They got the headphones on. They got their shirts off, wearing shorts, catching passes, whatever. I was wondering about your pregame routine. Say maybe ninety minutes or an hour. 
until game time. Did you do anything special each time? Not, not really, not each time. The only thing that I, I, I did as a routine, um, you know, I, I would put my left shoe on first <laughs> all the time. That was my, that was my thing. I, I had my left shoe on, um, before I always put my left shoe on first. And I, I, I would, I would go out, depending on if, it, if, how, what, what the weather was like. It was rainy. I didn't want to really be out there. Didn't want to get wet, so I wouldn't really go out. But if it's a it's a nice day, you want to go out there and you know get a feel uh, what, for the field, depending on you know you know what what field, what kind of field you're playing on turf or whatever. Um, but uh, it my my thing was kind of I was really kind of to myself. I uh, didn't want to hear a whole lot of music. Didn't didn't really care too much mm-hmm. about the music type uh, like the guys are doing now. You know, it was more of visualizing for me and I would like to visualize what, what I what I want to do on different plays and you know you, you know you visualize yourself actually you visualize yourself scoring touchdowns you visualize yourself making the big the good block you visualize yourself making that catch and you know those are the things that, that that I did and you know a lot of times you you know we, we I tell a lot of kids all the time you know you got to see it before you see it and so that that's one of the things that I used to do uh is just visualize uh seeing myself uh, running through the hole seeing myself making the block seeing myself making the catch and you know just you know just seeing the game before it actually happens and uh you know trying to get everything uh, in your head and then like a whole lot of rah rah uh but you know it's it's good it, it was good you know coming up in high school and and in college but when i got to the to the league i, I wasn't really a whole rah 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 kind of guy it was kind of like just you know, make sure I take care of my assignment and and make sure I, I do my job and, and you know just like the Patriots, Patriots say now you know do your job and that's that's what I was all about. And Tony, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the show when uh, former Bucks defensive end Walter Carter joins us. But looking looking at you know back on the rules changes that have come about over the last few years, do you think the game is safer now? Not only for not only for the current players. But for the kids, right, that are starting out, whether it's in Pop Warner football, middle school football, high school football, so that, you know, when they get to be, you know, our age, then they're not going to be going through the same the same things that uh, that, that you guys are going through now. I, I think it is. I think it, I think what they've been doing now as far as uh, teaching kids the, the correct way to hit and uh, not leading with your head, and I think it's a lot safer than, than it was when we were back then. And the equipment is better. I mean, you know, some of the equipment, especially the helmets that we were playing with when I was playing, man, I still have my helmet, um, uh, from, from when I played with the Patriots. And I look at it, I was like, wow, <laughs> there's, there's no padding in my helmet. <laughs> and I, and I'm wow. I'm wondering if that, if that Rydell helmet that, you know, that famous Rydell helmet and there's hardly no padding in that thing. And my son, uh, you know, I have my little, I have my little room. My son has a, a, a pit hammer that he played for when he was at University of Pittsburgh. And the difference in, in that, that, that's, that's, this was back in 2009 when he played there. The difference between my helmet and, and his helmet, it's like, it's like my helmet is like, it should have been like in the 1940s or something, man. It's just like, wow, I, I, I played with that helmet on. And, and and it was it's it's kind of it every time I look at it, I was like man I don't know how I did that but I guess I did but uh, yeah the equipment is much better the the techniques are much better than 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 before and I think uh, the, the the rules that they changed they changed it for the best you know a lot of a lot of the guys you know a lot of some some of the older guys say well you know football is not like it used to be but uh, you know the guys are much bigger now they're faster they're stronger. Uh, and, and so you, I think what, what they're doing now is going to make the game last a little bit longer because you know, there was a time, man, where, uh, two, maybe two or three years ago that I, I thought maybe football was going to come to an end because of everything that was going on. You know, guys, you know, getting paralyzed, guys dying in practice and different things like that, man. I, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough to, it was tough to see that happen to a game that you love so much. But, and, and see and see guys actually dying on the field. Uh, it, it was pretty 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 sad. But I, I think what they're doing now, I think it's going to help football a lot, uh, especially at the Pop Warner level and, and, the, and the middle school level, teaching these kids the correct way to hit uh, and getting that information to out to the kids. And the most the most important thing, the helmets that they're using now 
are far, far better than the ones that we used to use. Tony, before we let you go, remind our listeners about all the great things you're doing helping kids get off to college. Tony Collins, foundation.com, Tony Collins, TonyCollinsSpeaks.com. Just go to both those websites. Uh, man, we're just we're just doing a lot of things. We're kind of on a downswing waiting for school to start back up again. And that's right around the corner. It's going to be hitting these schools and uh, talking to as many kids as we can to get them scholarships going again for, for this upcoming year. There you go. Tony, take care, my friend. Great catching up with you this week. We look forward to catching up with you again next week. In between now and then, all the best to you and your family. You take Absolutely. care, Absolutely. Thanks to you guys. You guys have a great one. All right. Take care, Tony. That's uh, former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins. We've got our next guest, Terry Hanratty, hanging on the line. We'll get to Terry after this uh, short station ID. Hear your favorite NFL legends sharing their stories and insights every week right here on Thursday Night Tailgate with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Take it away, guys. When the door is locked, there's no way out. And now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is former Steelers quarterback Terry Hanready. Let me let me remind you a little bit more about Terry's background. He's from Butler, Pennsylvania, which is about 35 miles north of Pittsburgh. We got a little Pittsburgh theme going tonight, which is fantastic. In high school, Terry was a four sports star. He played football, basketball, baseball, and he also ran track. Played his college ball at Notre Dame, where he was a three-year starter and a two-time All-American and a part of their 1966 National Championship team, along with our good friend and Thursday Night Tailgate Hall of Famer, Rocky Blyer. Of course, Terry and and Rock would uh, reunite in their days in Pittsburgh as well. Terry is still ranked 11th all-time in passing and touchdown, passing yards and touchdown passes at Notre Dame. He was a second-round draft pick by the Steelers in 69. Played in the NFL from 69 to 76. All but his last season was in Pittsburgh. He finished with one season with the Tampa Bay Bucks in their inaugural season in the league. Terry was a part of two of the Steelers Super Bowl championship teams in the 1970s. He was there for Super Bowls 9 and 10. And we're excited that he is back with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Terry, Chris, and Bob here. Thanks for coming back on the show. Welcome back. Well, thanks for inviting me, guys. You know, this has changed my life. You're just invited to come. You're glad to invite anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I was what? I didn't realize I was still on, on, the, on the radar as passing yards because, you know, you didn't throw the ball that many times back then. You couldn't play as a freshman back then. So, you know, you only had really three years to accumulate everything. But um, I'm at yeah. my famous university right now. My daughter's enrolling, and uh, we should be spending a lot of time out here this year. Oh, good for you. Congratulations to Excellent. your daughter as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, Terry, going back to your time at Notre Dame, and you got to play for Air Parsegian. Unfortunately, we, we lost yeah. coach not that long ago. We just kind of wanted to get your memories of uh, Coach Parsegian and, and what he taught you, not only about football, but about life, too. Well, he was, he came into my life, you know, as a, uh, at the perfect time for me because I was, you know, I was from the broken home, father was, you know, mother split up and I needed that, that man in my life and Air was the, the perfect man for it. You know, cause I, I had a tendency to get, have a wild hair occasionally and, uh, he would, he would make sure that I was tamed down, you know, and, and it goes beyond that. You know, he would call me to his office and, you know, I'm looking at your schedule. You don't have any classes for the next two hours. Come on over. Let's talk. And we just talk about life. I mean, and it would, we never even talked an X or an O. You know, it was just, you know, how you doing? What, you know, what, what class you having trouble with? What do you like? What do you know? Things like that. You know, just sort of get the, the, the vibe of his quarterback. And, uh, he was a very special person. You know, he lived to be 94 and everybody said, well, what a great life, you know, 94 years old. But people forget, you know, he, he buried his daughter. His daughter <laughs> contracted multiple sclerosis when she was 20. She died at 61. And, you know, he wow. fought for MS for 40 years for, for her, raising money. And to find out his son, Michael, uh, three of his kids, three of uh, Era's grandchildren had Neiman Pick Class C, which means you cannot get rid of the cholesterol in your body. And uh, three out of the four children died before they were age 12. So that was so wow. much sorrow in his life. Yeah. So it uh, took his uh, special present. No doubt. Terry, like like I mentioned in your intro, you you spent the majority of your playing career, college and in the pros, alongside Rocky Blyer, who's a great friend, you know, of this show. We've we've had the privilege of having Rock on many times. 
Talk about the, the relationship you? the two of you guys did he, had. Did he charge you? Did he charge you when you came on the show? <laughs> he did not. Thank goodness. We've wow, had him on yeah. about a dozen times, so we'd be broke by now if we had to pay him. There you go. No, Rock is he's, he's he is who he is. You know, just a great human being. You know, we're together here in Notre Dame, and uh, then you know, reunited with the Steelers after his little stint in Vietnam. And he lived with our fam, my family, when he came back to Vietnam. There's no way in hell. I would take taken any bet in the world that he would have never played again. And if you just said, okay, what odds you give me that he would have rushed for a thousand yards? Back then when a thousand yards meant something, it was only 14 games. Right. And I'm going, you're crazy. I would have, I would have lost every child I ever had to, to that bet. I mean, it was, uh, but he came back and, uh, you know, just a lot of hard work. I mean, he just killed himself in the gym and, and on the track and, you know, and rocked a hell of a player. And to that end, Terry, right? I mean, the chief gave him a couple of years, right? Carried him on the taxi squad to, you know, kind of he, let he him did, heal up, it, try to work it, his it, way back, right? What was that like it, for you guys watching him kill himself, try to get back? Well, you know, there was, you know, Mr. Rooney, he was just salt of the earth. And, you know, he said, Rock, if you want to go to, you know, uh, law school, I'll put you in law school. Here, either Pitt or Duquesne or, you know, one of the schools here. Great law school. He's Rock said, no. Mr. Rooney, I want to come back. I want to come back. He said, okay, take your time. Take your time. We got you got all the medical people you need here. Whatever you need, I'll pay it for. It. And uh, wow, crazy. Ab- I mean, absolutely crazy. He he made it back, but uh, he did. The very few could do it. Bob, questions for Terry. It's great to speak with you again, Terry. I want to ask you one more thing about era. Uh, you know, when I think back and when I was starting to watch college football back in the 60s, 70s, um, Terry, I mean, I, I look at era coming out of that tunnel, running with the cleats on. He always seemed like such a motivative, upbeat type of guy. But compare that to his X's and O's ability. I mean, this this guy obviously was an incredible coach in every way, but uh, tell us some more about uh, his strengths as, a, as an overall coach. Well, the, his X's and O's were second to none. I mean, we never had, we were never surprised in any game. There were games we didn't perform well enough, but we never went in and said, whoa, where'd that come from? We never expected that. You know, Aaron, he, he, uh, he prepared us for every single thing that we were going to see on that Saturday. And the thing is, if we screw up, the, the biggest factor is Era took the blame. I mean, he, after the game, you hear his talk, it sounded like he played the game. You know, after that, you know, we shouldn't have thrown that pass, you know, it was a bad call, blah, blah, blah. He never put it on anybody but himself. And I think, you know, players really re- respond to stuff like that. Yeah, great guy. And uh, I wanted to talk about that 69 draft a little bit, Terry. I mean, O.J. Simpson, Mean Joe Green, Roger Worley, a lot of Hall of Famers, et cetera. Uh, second round, uh, tell me about your expectations that day and uh, how it all came about when uh, Pittsburgh called you. Well, Chuck Noll called. You know, back then there was no big hoopla. You know, no. you sat in your dorm room. And they either called you in the dorm or they called your sports information director at the time, Roger Belvisari. And he would call you and say, okay, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles shows you and blah, 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 whatever. And, uh, you know, there wasn't this big hurrah where you, you know, get the, the, the rented suits and all the jewelry and, you know, walk on stage and get your picture taken with the commissioner. But, you know, it, it was just, you know, Chuck called and it was nice because, you know, you're going home. Basically, my home is, you know, 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, so it was nice to, to be going back home and, and, uh, thing that really, you know, in my athletic career, you know, I could not have played for a better university and I could not have played for a better family in the Rooney. I mean, they were, you know, I'm, I've been a lucky person. I mean, very, very young mm-hmm. to have those type of people in my life. And my high school football coach, Art Bernardi, which very few know except around Western Pennsylvania, he is a National Hall of Fame coach. Eric Barcini mm-hmm. is a National Hall of Fame coach. Chuck Noll is a Hall of Fame coach. So I, I had it nice, man. I had greatness around me. I had great players around me. And I learned from the best. And it was, you know, you probably couldn't draw it up better than I had it. And, Terry, the, the talk of, you know, and Bob, you mentioned, you know, you're being drafted there in 69. And, you know, you came along with Joe Green. And, you know, Joe, by his own admission, acted very poorly 
early on, almost walked away from the team at one point because of all the losing that was going on. So what was it like, you know, early on for you guys dealing with the mean part of Joe Green? Well, no, I mean, Joe, Joe was a, Joe was mean between the lines. You know, Joe needed to be talked to. Uh, Joe's a great guy. He really is. You know, I, I feel bad for him because he's the only one left in the, in our four, four men line. And those are all right. buddies of his and they're all buddies of mine. And they, you know, to have those kind of losses in your life. But back in the day, you know, no one, I mean, yeah, coming from Notre Dame, we never lost. You know, we got a lot of game here or there, but we never had a losing streak. And, and when you're at Pittsburgh, we open up, we won the first game against Detroit. Then we lost 13 straight. And, you know, pretty much got our ass kicked in every one of them. And, uh, and then you start shaking your head and go, whoa, this is, this is, you know, let me put me back in school. But you had to believe in Chuck Noll. Chuck had a plan. And to think about what would happen nowadays if Chuck was hired, he was, you know, relatively unknown, you know, defensive coordinator and with the, with the Colts with Shula. But, you know, no one really knew his name. And if, if he was hired today and he goes one and 13 his first year, where do you think he is? Right. You're not with the Steelers anymore, you know, or not with any other team. You know, they fire him. The Steelers wouldn't, but, but, but any other team, you know, you gotta have patience in this league too. Chuck, Chuck had a plan. He knew that the talent on the Steelers back then was not great. There were some good pieces. Yes, yes, yes. We can, you know, put people around this guy, that guy, this guy. And he never traded for anybody. He didn't want anybody else's problems. He wanted to get them out of college, mold them to his specifications, and go from there. And that's where it is. If you look at those teams, they're all draft choice. Right. You know, I don't think, I don't, I can't remember one guy who was traded for. And that was Chuck's draft and the, you know, Dan, or Art Rooney Jr. was about part of the draft and, uh, you know, a lot of other guys. And it was, uh, you know, that, that, that's where they were going to do it. But you couldn't do it today that way because no one has that kind of patience. Except Terry, the after you I mean, imagine, left the Steelers. Imagine the yet. Steelers. Well, imagine What's the that? Steelers. Your... Yeah. Since 1969, three coaches. Right. And every one of those coaches won at least one Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, if you were an owner, hire some GM, hire some head coach and say, get your ass to Pittsburgh and talk to the Rooney family for a couple of days and see (laughs) what they look for, how they do it. And to boggle my mind, it's not done. Everybody tries to do it other ways. But if you look at the Steelers, you know, that's a lot of winning. Yeah. Agreed. (laughs) So, Terry, like I say, you know, after your, after your time with the Steelers, you got that one year. And Tampa Bay, which happened to be their first season, their expansion year, team went 0 and 14. It, ironically, your last start as a quarterback comes against the Steelers that year. What, what was it like being a part of a the Bucks that season, and then lining up against your uh, your buddies with the Steelers? Well, you got to realize, no, I saw the NFL like no one else. My rookie year with Pittsburgh we were 1 and 13. My last year with Tampa 0 and 14, and two Super Bowls <laughs> in the middle. No one's ever. I don't think anybody's ever done that. But we knew right. that the Steelers team, I mean, the Steelers game, you know, John McKay said, you know, it'd be, it's going to be, hey, it'll be nice for you to start against your own team, your old teammates. I'm going to, I said, who, who suggested that? <laughs> because <laughs> that, those bucket, that buck team was not a good team, you know, 0-14. And, and there were a lot of guys that, you know, we go on the road and some, some guy that won't mention their name said, you know, we should have just, you know, mailed in it and saved the, saved the airfare. <laughs> but, uh, well, we, we got there and we started the game and it was, it was like, oh, you know, I, I came up the line of scrimmage. I thought it was a practice for Pittsburgh. I was looking against the first team defense. And then we'd try to throw, and Joe would bust through the line. He would grab me and set me down. Lambert would blitz. He would grab me and set me down. LC, same way. So, you know, I don't think we crossed the 50 in the in the first half. So at halftime, John said, let's get, you know, Steve Spurry, a great friend. You know, he said, let's see if Steve can't get something going in the second half. So he goes out there, and they – kicked the shit out of him. <laughs> they were <laughs> blitzing and they were going in and hitting him and taking him down. And he come off the field and said, man, your boys took care of you. They're, they're beat my ass up. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was an interesting game. <laughs> Put it that way. That's a, you know, Chuck let the clock run in the fourth quarter. Yeah. You know, he told the officials, you know, this, this is, you know, this is not fair. You know, just let the clock run yeah. and get out of here. And, you mentioned head coach, you know, John McKay, who was a real character. I love some of the things that he used to come out with. My favorite was, we didn't tackle well today, but we made up for it by not blocking either. 
So yeah, he, he well, always with the sort of the one liners. What was he like? He, he's, you know, always the one liner. Like the other one was, uh, "What do you think about your team's execution?" He says, "I'm all for it." <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, those things, those things are comical now. But at the time, you know, you're getting your ass kicked. You don't need a smart ass coach coming up with this shit. You know, you really don't. <laughs> And that, that's the way we all felt, you know. You know, John McKay's great at banquets, you know. But uh, you know, if they learned how to coach better, we probably would have been better. You know, I'm not saying that we're going to go in the Super Bowl, but uh, you know, there was. That's why that one year I went. I said, "This is it for me." You know, I'm retiring. But that would be yeah. know, nice to get out to an expansion team and you know, sort of lay on them what you know I learned in my my Hall of Fame coaches that I played for. But after that one year, you saw the whole makeup. Of the coaching staff and John and you know you just don't like to be you know if you said that today imagine that you said that you'd have the players association all over you'd have every player's attorney jumping all over you you can't get away with that stuff but John John thought it was funny I'm glad he got a kick out of it we didn't so Terry before we let you go I got to get your thoughts how, how do you feel about the Steelers you know this season how do you feel about you know their chances to finally get maybe you know, obviously got to win the division first but get past the Patriots and maybe play for another Super Bowl Well that's the whole thing it's getting back you know when does Tom Brady even slow down you know he talks about when he's going to retire I'm just saying when's he going to slow down you know this guy is a machine and I think the most valuable person up in that New England organization is the offensive line coach because Tom doesn't get hit much and that's no, their scheme on the offensive line. I, I'd love to watch, just watch film of the line and see how they block because you can't really see it on TV. It's just, you know, a blur. But, uh, you know, they're always going to be there. I think the Steelers, you know, Ben stays healthy. I think we're going to be just fine because he's got a lot of weapons to work with. I think they're making a lot of adjustments on defense. You know, they've added a few pieces and they had a lot of young guys got a full year under their belt. I think uh Mike Tomlin is I think he's a wonderful coach no matter what Bradshaw says. I think he gets the best <laughs> out of these kids and you can and you can see what you know you can see that these guys play for him. They wanna play, they wanna win. And uh, I think it's gonna be a good year for Pittsburgh. I really do. Terry, before we let you go, how can our listeners stay up to date with uh what you're doing over social media? I don't do my oh, you mean on Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, I don't do my, you know, I, 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 I sort of enjoy that. I never thought, when my daughter first went to college, she, she put me on Facebook and LinkedIn. You know, I didn't know how to do that stuff. You know, I'm the old school. And I sort of got a kick, getting a kick out of Facebook. You know, you can sort of add and subtract who you want to. You know, anybody who's against Trump, I just throw them out. Uh, you know, and, and uh, but everybody else, you know, we have a good time and, you know, exchange thoughts and exchange jokes. And, you know, I don't see any problem with that. Terry, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show tonight. Congratulations again to your daughter for getting into, into Notre Dame. Have a great well, uh, have a great time there, and we look forward. We hope you come back again and join us again real soon. Well, you got my number, so give me a call anytime. time. All right. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Okay. Thank you. Take care. That is uh, former Steelers quarterback Terry Hanready. I love that piece at the end. I don't care what Bradshaw says. <laughs> <laughs> about Thomas, so that's great stuff, Bob. He's fantastic. I love Terry. Colorful guy, and uh, what stories he has, and uh, always a pleasure speaking with him. Yeah, absolutely it is. We've got our next guest, Harvey Armstrong, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Harvey on the other side of this quick station identification. You're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate, where NFL legends live on, with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lasseri. Available on TuneIn and Podbean. Now, back to Chris and Bob. Just listen. And now, joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Harvey Armstrong. Let me give you some background on Harvey. He's from Houston, Texas, played his college ball at SMU, where he was named All-Southwest Conference his junior and senior seasons. He was the uh, co-captain in 1981 and helped lead the Mustangs to the Southwest Conference title, a 10-1 and record and a number five ranking you know, in the nation that year. He was inducted into the SMU Hall of Fame back in 2014. He was a seventh-round draft pick in 1982 by the Philadelphia Eagles, and he played in the NFL from 82 to 1990 for the Eagles and the Colts. And beyond all of that, he shares the same birthday with my oldest daughter. But, Bob, I, you know, I certainly hope my wife doesn't found, find out that we've got Harvey on the show tonight because when we were at the Hall of Fame inductions, he terrorized her 
all night long. You know, so we're just sort of now getting out of the therapy from the night that, that she spent <laughs> sitting next to Harvey. And uh, I could get into a bunch of trouble if she found out Harvey was on the show. But we're honored that Harvey is with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Harvey, Chris and Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Harvey, how you doing? How you doing, Bob? Good. You guys hear me? So, yep. Harvey, I want to start off our time with you tonight by going back to your time at SMU. I'm curious, you know, how was SMU able to keep you away from Texas, Texas A&M, the University of Houston, oh, by the way, and Oklahoma for that matter as well? How did they get you to go to SMU? Well, we have always vowed and not to tell a total truth about some of the, the things that was offered to us. <laughs> so I'm going to say political <laughs> correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, SMU, to be totally honest, I mean, SMU was in a great city. It was a great atmosphere for me to be part of, for me to be the beginning, the start of something new. Uh, Texas had the tradition. A&M had a winning tradition. And for me to, I wanted to leave Houston. And so for me to go to SMU, it was something that I can start, something that I can be a pioneer. Um, and it was a great city. It was close to my home. And, and, and they just, the, the, the head coach there, Ron Meyer, was just such a great recruiter. I mean, he can sell a drowning man a, a glass of water. He was just that good and convincing to my parents. And they had a great business school, <clears throat> what, what I wanted to major in. And um, I, those things there just really took me away from the Texas because I just knew I would go to Texas. I knew I, would, I, I thought I might go to Oklahoma at the end. Uh, but SMU was able to convince me that I can be the start of something brand new and of something of great, which which came to true. And Harvey, you were there during the uh, you know the Pony Express days with Eric Dickerson and Craig James and that team. What was it like trying to chase those two guys around during practice? Oh well, they wouldn't let us hit them, so it was a blessing when we got got in the spring game and we can actually tackle them. But but it was always uh, – it was a challenge. You know, those guys were very good, very talented, very fast. Uh, but they were so good that they wouldn't let us uh, tackle them or get get to them. So, in the spring game, uh, it was a lot of trash talking. And, and we got – it got to be so physical that they pulled Craig and Eric out. Uh, and, and I wish Eric would listen to this show now because he, he would definitely have an argument and, 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 and disagree with that. But we 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 would kill them in the spring game. <laughs> <laughs> and Harvey, like you mentioned at the top, right? You know, we've all sort of seen the the thirty for thirty episode, the Pony Excess, and you know what happened down there early in the mid eighties. Crazy time for the SMU program, and you went through the early part of that. So, what was it like as a college kid? You're a part of the team. You've got all these sort of outside, you know, swirling issues. You know, the Dallas oil money flowing around everywhere. What was it like, sort of being in the middle of that sort of storm, if you will? It, it was. It was. It was. You know, I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm thinking. I'm laughing, but I never called home for money. I never had to <laughs> ask my parents because uh, they send money for washing clothes. Uh, Christmas time, we didn't have to look for Christmas gifts. Uh, the things that we can, the things that was going on at SMU was was amazing. It was great for an eighteen year old kid. It was overwhelming at times. Uh, but but what I always say in, in defense of SMU, that's what was going on in the Southwest Conference. You know, and 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 my my senior year of high school, I was offered a house for my parents. I was offered. Now I'm not talking about at SMU. I'm talking about other colleges. I, I, I'll I'll give you guys a little dirt about SMU. But other schools offered me homes, cars, central air, burglar bars, <laughs> carpet for my home, clothes for my parents and my brothers and sisters, shoes. When we played in the afternoon, we had our whole team was, was furnished by college uniforms. I'm talking about the T-shirts, the sneakers, the cleats. I mean, we had all kind of things given to us. So my freshman year, I mean, is that I actually signed a contract to go to SMU. And so if I made all <laughs> software conference, if I made new company gear, now I'm giving you all some dirt that, that I've never, never publicly said it with a mic or somebody can record this or it'll be my, my statement. I didn't say that. No, no, what? But, but now I know this <laughs> being recorded. It's streaming live. It'll be played again. But the things that was offered at SMU was amazing. Um, 
and so uh, of course I had a brand new car my sophomore year, and then I had a brand new car my senior year. So in two years, four years, I had two brand new cars. I'm not talking about pre-owned. I'm talking about a Cougar. I'm talking about a Lincoln Mark Six that I received my senior year. So so and and I'm looking at myself. I'm thinking I'm like golly, I've never told this story. I really haven't. I really never <laughs> told this to tell people what. So 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 to go back to your question. <laughs> Cause I'm like, am I saying way too much? But, but, you know, me and Eric have, we're, we're getting together and we're writing a book about the real story at SMU. 30 for 30, it gives you a lot of facts. It lets you know how deep it was because the governor was involved in the political side of it. Uh, but, but it was so much untold in that cause they, they asked me, I had, they interviewed me and they asked me, Harvey, so why won't you tell us on air what SMU gave you? It's in the book. I said, well, the book might not, that, that's not what I said. Cause we kind of said we, 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 we wouldn't really tell the true story on, on TV and, and it for the media because they look at SMU so bad, but it was going across the board at, in the Southwest Conference, the Houston, the A&M, the Texas, Texas was, was cheap, but TCU, Wake Baylor, I mean, all the schools was offering us top dollars and top things and houses and cars and clothes. So I've told you guys way so, too much, Chris. Way I'm gonna go back to War <laughs> Eagles or something. I gotta go back to something. Where your wife at? We need her we need her to spur this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so so Harvey, I mean so if you fast forward if you are, are you were you surprised at all when you know in eighty seven when they got the death penalty, were you shocked to hear that? Did <laughs> SMU got the death penalty? Yes, I was very shocked. I really was because as I stated, it was going across, it was going on across the board. And it right. got to a point where they really couldn't stop it. SMU did it on a high level, but, but the A&M, the Houston, all the guys, all the teams in the Southwest Conference was doing it. So when we got the depth in the yes, I was very, very surprised to be totally honest. But it, it just got to a point where you really couldn't stop it. Cause when you stop it, then the players start running their mouth and telling off on the, the, you know, well, they offered me this and they did this. Oh, and they got the death penalty. I didn't think the NCAA would would penalize it to that degree. Five questions for Harvey. Harvey, it's great to speak with you again. The uh, you know I I looked at uh, the legacy of Kashmir High School. I know you want to give them a shout out. I I was impressed from that high school went on to the league, especially guys like Rodney Hampton, Delvin Williams, some big names. Harvey, I was just wondering. Uh, do you still, uh, is there a major strong alumni net- network down there? Do you keep in uh, touch with some of these? That That's some tradition down there. Yes, we do. We have a formal players, uh, athletic association that we go to a banquet and go to, uh, get, we do every year. Uh, you didn't mention Jacob Green, Mark Lewis. And so mm. they came out with a poll this morning on, on ESPN. I was watching it. I got this. I was so disappointed. Because they, they, they didn't mention, they were talking about the cities that they have NFL players. The, the smallest cities that people have, have come, NFL players have come from. In Texas, or uh, Houston wasn't even, I should say Houston, Houston wasn't even named. Within a 15 block radius of, in my high school area, as you stated, 15 guys played in the NFL two years or more. Mm-hmm. I thought that was very it was amazing. And, you know, Rodney Hampton would be one of the top guys. Jacob Green would be coming up for the Hall of Fame that you didn't mention. Um, mm. Of course, you, you have the Harvey Armstrong. I'm not the big name, but, of course, I'm still from that neighborhood in Cashmere. So, big shout-out to Cashmere High. Uh, we, we were definitely top dogs. They talk about Port Nature's Grove and Memorial, and, and they talk about Friday Night Lights. And that kind of disappointed me that they don't talk about Cashmere. <clears throat> And Harvey, when you got to the league in 82, Vermeil was your head coach and uh, ultimately was replaced by Marion Campbell, who was the uh, defensive coordinator that first year. Talk to me about Campbell as far as the difference between him as a coordinator and when he became the head coach. Oh, when he became a head coach, I mean, it was just a different flavor. Dick Vermeil mm-hmm. was, 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 was just so fiery, so emotional. Uh, so into the players and had so much passion. Uh, Swamp Fox, as we called him when he took over, he just was a laid back type of coach. Uh, he had been there for a while 
and he just didn't have that same fiery mindset and mentality and raw, raw type of, of attitude that Dick Vermeer had. Dick Vermeer was like, wow. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. I mean, my, my rookie year playing for him was so outstanding. And I had a chance to talk to him at the Hall of Fame this past, well, a couple of weeks ago he was there. And I just said, thank you for drafting me. He didn't, had no idea who I was. He didn't remember me, but but I I I, I told him who I was. You draft because he didn't he didn't allow himself to get to know the rookie. Dick Vermeer did, and and so he just was he was all about the veteran, and so the difference of the two to answer the question is just he just was a laid back type of coach, and Dick Vermeer was in your face, raw raw type of guy, and, mm-hmm. and had you ready to run through a wall, uh, in his pre in his pre game speeches. He even got emotional, would even cry. You know, for a 21-year-old rookie seeing a grown man cry with with the guys making that kind of money, that was very, very, wow. It was very overwhelming, and it, it was just it was just great to see. And, Harvey, you know, coming out of SMU, again, where you guys had success, right? You, you were a co-captain of the team. You're later inducted into the Hall of Fame, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Minute, but were you surprised that you weren't drafted until the seventh round? I mean, how much more successful could you have been to not get as as much attention as you probably deserved? Surprised? I was crushed. I was crushed, and I was telling my wife the story how how I was drafted the second day. At that time, we had twelve rounds, and so I was projected to go in the second or third round to New England because at that time, Ron Meyer and the whole staff who recruited me out of high school and coached me for four years, they went to New England. But their biggest need was defense alignment. Of course, they took Kenneth Sims, the first pick that year, and from University of Texas. Uh, and so when I didn't get drafted by them, then my name started floating because, well, why wouldn't New England take Harvey Armstrong in the third round or the fourth round and where I was projected to go? Uh, and so... When I didn't get drafted to the second day, Dick Vermeer called me at 8.05 a.m. I was still just emotionally a wreck. I, I really wanted to say, no, I don't want to play with you guys. I want to go to Canada. And so, of course, I wasn't that stupid. Uh, but I was very, <laughs> very, I was very, very crushed. Very surprised. Everybody was calling me, of course, the, the night, the night of the draft, the first round. The first, you know, six rounds, they was calling me in. So it, it was a very surprise, a very emotional. I mean, I cried like a baby. I really did. But I just vowed that I was, I, I, I would show all these teams that who passed on me. But I just, I just at that point, I wanted to go to count. And Harvey, as I sort of look back over, you know, your game logs and you know the the games you got to be a part of and play in, the the first sack that I saw you get credit for, and they you know they didn't credit guys for sacks until '82, but the first one I saw you get credit for came against Washington and Joe Theismann. Do you remember? Do you remember sack number one? Do I? Do I remember? Yes, I can tell you the move I put on the deep on the offensive line. <laughs> the lineman that oh yes I and I and I tease Joe about that of course he don't really he don't he knows my he doesn't know my name but he know if I say Harvey Armstrong he's not gonna come up to me and say hey Harvey but I say when I see him I say Joe you know I you 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 were my first sack he said Harvey I hear that damn story all the time so you need to stop telling me that <laughs> I said well <laughs> you were my first so I'm just you know you gonna always mean something to me so it's kind of like going back and forth joke that. That, that I have played on him, but yes, I do remember that, and that was an outstanding day, and, and it was a big sack, too, at that time, so uh, yeah, I, I celebrated like a Mark Gaffineau, uh, you know, some of the people that's listening, <laughs> they probably don't have a clue who he is, but, but he's one of the outstanding defensive linemen who had that crazy dance, and yeah, I celebrated way too much, and in, in the, in the guys, they gave me a hard time, like, Rook, Rook, you got to act like you're going to come back and get another one. Well, I don't know when these times. You never know. <laughs> so. And Harvey, a few years later, you had two sacks in a game against the Packers up in the cold in Green Bay. What was it like to have a big game, you know, in that stadium on that field? Now you guys are bringing back some memories that I that, that you know. Of course, my 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 family haven't. They didn't see me play. My wife, my daughter, they'd never seen me play. So of course. You know, I used to tell them I was pretty good. I don't have the big name, but I but 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 you did play pretty good in the Green Bay game. 
Um, wow, I'm, I'm just sitting here smiling, thinking, yeah, I had a pretty big game. I had like nine tackles, two sacks. I, I, I blocked the pass with like three seconds to go and kind of won the game or was a big part of the win. Um, so, so that was outstanding for me to play that big and that type in that stadium, uh, with all the history there. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I have tape of that now. Nobody wants to watch it in my house, but every now and then I used to just kind of look back and, 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 and have some flashbacks with it. But you guys got me smiling now thinking about, wow, I really did play. I had a big game that game. So thanks a lot for bringing that up, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Harvey. <laughs> Bob, yeah, one more for Harvey before we let him go. I do. I'm going to, I'm going to keep making Harvey happy. His resume was complete in 86 with the one interception, Harvey. Do you still have the ball? Take me back to that day. It must have looked yeah. like a huge thing coming down at you. <laughs> I, you know what? It was against the Giants. It was against, uh, uh Bill, not Sim, it was Sim, Phil Sims. And, and it was a third down. He was rolling. <laughs> it's amazing how, you know, I, I do have some loss of memory from CTE, but it's amazing how certain things just God lives like yesterday. But, but it was a rollout and he, I tipped it and, and I caught it and I had a free 40 yard route to the end zone and I tripped. I stumbled uh. and I fell. No one tackled me. <laughs> of course, Sims just came and touched me, but, but that interception, uh, I could have scored, uh, but of course I was too clumsy and, and too excited. And do I still have that football? Yes, I do. I wish I was in my my basement. I wish I would have to I would have to do a Snapchat or whatever they do nowadays. My daughter with these pictures, but yes, I still do have that. I have my first NFL interception football in my trophy room in the basement. That's great. And Harvey, you know, you were teammates with our mutual friend Jeff Harrod, who we saw get inducted into the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame earlier this summer. Talk about what it was like playing alongside Jeff. Jeff, Jeff is a beast. You know, people don't mention his name enough. Uh, Jeff was one of the best linebackers in the NFL. Uh, I think he led the lead in tackles a couple of years. And Jeff would play hurt because that's why he's so beat up now. Uh, but Jeff, Jeff was very intelligent. I mean, he was physical. He was fast. He was quick and he knew it and he knew where the play was coming. I mean, you would hear Jeff yell out hard and strong was coming. Donnell, I mean, so he just, he studied the game. He was physical and, and it, it just, it just, it, it disappoints me that people don't talk about Jeff Leroy as one of the top linebackers in the NFL. You know, the coach don't have him in the ring of honor. Disappointed about that. And, and the NFL, yeah. they just really don't talk about him as much. I was so, so thrilled to see him get inducted into the Alabama Hall of Fame, and and he deserved it. But he deserved more recognition in, in the NFL because he was a tenth round draft pick coming out. Of course, none of us thought he would be anything. He was kind of short, stubby, always running around in practice, hitting everything they walk. We called him All Eagle Creek because in practice, when he didn't post, it, when he shouldn't have to fit, when he shouldn't hit people, he was hitting people. And his whole career was like that. Throughout his, his career, Jeff Farrar is, I, you know, I, I, you see what kind of praise I have for him. I think he was one of the best linebackers ever to play the game. And people just don't realize that. But if you sit there and watch tape, Chris, I think you would agree with this because you know him and you see him. So maybe we buy it. But even taking the bias out, the fact that I like the guy, I think he's, uh, you know, love him like a brother. If you watch Jeff Farrar play a whole game consistently, you're going to see 54 show up. You're going to see him show up every snap. Every time the ball is somewhere, he's there. Yeah, no doubt. He was a great player, and I can agree with you more. He doesn't get the credit don't he tell, deserves, and I can't Jeff believe he's I not said. in the ring of honor. <laughs> I know. Don't tell Jeff I said all these. I know. I agree. Don't tell Jeff I said all these nice things about him. Now, you know he won't be able to handle that. So, you know, we're getting soft in our old age. But, but, but so, so if he asked me that, I mean, I ain't saying nothing good about you. I don't like you. <laughs> Harvey, before we let you go, let our listeners know what you're doing now. Uh, me and my wife have an all-state agency uh, uh, here in, 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 in Atlanta. Uh, so I also have a foundation, Starstruck Foundation. We deal with at-risk kids. We give our scholarships every year uh, to 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 the uh, youth here in Atlanta. Uh, so those out of those two things, along with my 11-year-old daughter, I have a daughter in L.A., 
but when she's here, they just keeps me busy. My 11 year old is doing everything from singing to acting to, to, to whatever. So that keeps me busy. Uh, so I'm just from the house, from insurance to my foundation to speaking with the kids. I do a lot of speaking engagement. Would love to do more. Uh, so people can always go to my, my foundation. Look me up at starstruckfoundation.org. Uh, so those are the things that I love doing, speaking and dealing with kids. And of course, hopefully when we hang up, I'm going to call you guys. Maybe I can get y'all insurance. Uh, so that's always <laughs> a, a, a <laughs> I'm going to always try to plug it up, but with McCarty Armstrong, I'll say the agency uh, here in Atlanta. So, but great stuff, Harvey. Thank you so business. much for your, for your, thank you so much for your time. You're fantastic. We got to get you back on the show again real soon. We hope you'll come back and join us again. Hey man, I would love to. I, I appreciate you guys. You guys keep doing great work. Right. Appreciate Take it. care, Harvey. All the best to you hey, and your wife hey. and your family. Thank you. Tell your wife I said hello and tell her I said War Eagle. <laughs> thank you Harvey alright uh, All right. thanks a lot good night that is uh, former Eagles and Colts nose tackle Harvey Armstrong never had to call home for money Bob when he was at SMU <laughs> interesting story can't wait for the book uh, yeah take take what you want from that but uh, pretty impressive Chris 7th round draft pick who played 8 years in the league and uh, that's pretty impressive and uh, played with some great players and uh, some Terrific, two two terrific franchises. So, uh, a lot of very colorful guy. Would love to speak with him again. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to get Harvey back on the show. And he and his wife were fantastic. We had a great time sitting with them at yeah. the Hall of Fame dinner. So, uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Cool. His wife was fantastic. So, look forward to getting Harvey back on the show again, real soon. All right, we've got our next guest, Walter Carter, hanging on the line. We'll get to him after this quick station ID. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcons tight end. And you're listening to TNT, Thursday Night Tailgate. Brace yourself for the explosion. All right, and now joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Walter Carter. Let me give you some background on Walter. He's from Richmond, Virginia, played his college ball at Florida State, where he was a part of Bobby Bowden's first team back at Florida State. So they came in together. He was a 10th round draft pick in 1980 by the Oakland Raiders, played in the league from 86 to 91 for the Raiders, Jets, and Bucks. He also played in the USFL for the Tampa Bay Bandits. And we are honored to have him with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Good evening, Walter. Chris and Bob here. Thanks for coming on the show. Good evening, Walter. Thank you for having me. Good to uh, listen in for a little while there. And uh, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, talk to you guys. I don't have a resume of your uh, former guests, but um, we all played the game we love. Indeed. So, Walter, I wanted to start our time with you by going back to your time at Florida State. So, you know, initially, how does a kid from Richmond, Richmond, Virginia, end up playing his college ball at FSU? Yeah, it was quite interesting. I guess I got really lucky on that one. But um, remember, Bobby Bowden was coaching and had done really well at West Virginia. So um, the coach that uh, coached the defensive line, George Henshaw, who had a fantastic career, ended up in the NFL, was um, recruiting me, and I really liked him, and um, and I really liked the uh, uh, coach Bowden and, the, and 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 what we were doing. I just was apprehensive about West Virginia. I kind of. Uh, I had grandparents in West Virginia, and every time I visited, uh, nothing against West Virginia. I just felt that it was just not my idea of college. And um, so I was kind of torn between, you know, where am I going to go? And, you know, but I really liked this coach. And um, at the time, I had some grade issues. And uh, I remember that Coach George Henshaw and I got together with the uh, guidance counselor, and we discussed ways for me to be um, at least um, accepted uh, into the school. And um, a lot of the bigger schools I had been recruiting me, Ohio State at that time was big time, and a lot of those guys kind of backed off because they didn't know if I was actually, I mean, literally make the grade. Uh, Football-wise, I did, but, you, you know, so they started kind of pushing me toward maybe junior college and some of those things. And I always felt that, you know, there was something out there, but I really couldn't, get my finger on it and I get this call from Bowden and uh, with George Henshaw that um, they were leaving West Virginia and um, they still wanted to recruit me and they were taking a job in you know Florida State 
Well, for me, out of Virginia, uh, you, you might as well say said Miami Beach. I just heard the word Florida, and I go, okay, I'm interested. <laughs> and said, would you visit? I go, sure, I'll take a visit to Florida, and that's all I could think of. And um, so, you know, um, it was it was like a dream come true, and I, it was just something that was um, – the opportunity came in his first year. I visited, and I came home, and I told my folks, I said, I'm going to go to Florida State. And they go, what? Where did you come up with that? And, you know, at the time, that was, a, a, a you know, a big change. They said all these schools in North Carolina, South Carolina, even West Virginia, and all of a sudden you're going all the way down to Florida. He goes, well, where did that come from? I said, I don't know. It just – I know that that coach is interested in me. He's always been interested in me. It's a brand new opportunity. Um, and the rest is history. His first year was my first year. My connection was his connection from West Virginia down to Florida State. Thinking about the field, I thought that new coach, new program. Then I did some research and I realized that there weren't a lot of palm trees, if any, any palm trees in Tallahassee. And that was a big old state. And I go, <laughs> I never heard of Tallahassee or Florida State. And um, I guess, you know, I, I've i always said that Bowden being the, you know, war um, historian that he is, that, you know, he was the general, and a general has to have some, you know, troops. And I think I just got assigned to his military or his army of uh, players, and I got to play real early because, again, I think the second game of the season, we got beat by Miami. I still remember it, 47 to nothing. I ain't had O.J. Anderson and everything else, and Bowden came in that locker room, and, um, you know, he said, I got to play a lot. He said, you know, we won't get embarrassed like this again. I think I played the whole second half, and I was on the field, and, of course, you know, the game was over, but I was just glad to be on that field, and that very next week, third game we were going to Oklahoma and um he said our program begins now I won't be I, I'm not going to get embarrassed like that again and I guess from most part he never did and I got my start that Oklahoma game and started pretty much for the next four years and first game I started was Oklahoma and the last game I started was Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl and we were undefeated so I think I got it right but I can't say I just <laughs> got really lucky and ended up on uh, on Bobby Bowden's uh, very first team and we all know the rest and four years later he said if you do what I say and I get three more classes like you guys we'll we'll play for it all and it it happened. He he you know he 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 was just I think really you know biblically assigned to uh, put his footprint on that uh, program, and I was just very fortunate to be one of one of Bobby's boys. So Walter, you know when you, when you look back at where the program was, right? You know the few years before Bowden took over, the team was zero and eleven, one and ten, three and eight. His first year, your first year, you guys were five and six, and then boom, ten and two. So, did you get a sense of what did, what changed? What did he do that got that you know, you guys and that program from five and six to ten and two in one season? You know, um, it was thirty years later where we all were up at one of these reunions when they brought Bobby uh, back, and um, you know I. And, and, and he had a uh, big booster meeting and uh, the auditorium was full. It was kind of, he had stayed away purposely for a few years to let Jimbo, you know, run his own show. And, and we know what Jimbo's meant to the program is, is just a great decision, uh, coaching, waiting the whole nine yards. But Bobby is a, a very classy man. He has the foresight now and he had it then. And he saw, um, this changing that happened and um he said at that at that point and, and and the guys were there we looked at each other because we've always felt it we always knew it because we were a part of it and and one of the guys they asked him a question not football player but one of the boosters it said coach you know you've got Heisman trophies you got you know national championship you had a run like no one else 14 years in the top 30s but out of all those teams, you know, we got to ask you, what what was your favorite team? And we just kind of, you know, 
you can't say it, but we kind of felt it. And for the first time, it was verbalized. He says, you know, that's a very difficult question. He said, it's like asking you your favorite kid. He says, you really can't say it, but you know it. He said, but looking back, I got to say my favorite team of all my 30-something years was my 1977 team. And, you know, I can remember it like it was yesterday. It was just validation. It came 30-something years later. But we knew it when you do it. You got to know it when you're in it. And when I give that, um, when I told you about that night of uh, 47 to nothing, I remember he brought in an entire freshman class. And at that time, I don't know what they do now, but I think you get to recruit 30 guys. So it was 20-something, 30 guys piled into Bowden's office, and he only wanted us. And he, he gave us this, this speech, and a lot of people remember the older Bowden, but I remember the fiery Bowden. And he, he, he said, men, and he told us, he says, I'll never put a team out there like that. He says, it doesn't matter about the score. I felt that there were some guys on that field that gave up. And he said, they're not my guys. You my guys. You're the beginning of what we're going to do in this program. And, of course, I'm a freshman. I don't know any better. I was just glad to be on the field. I got on the kickoff team, played a lot because we got blown out. And he said, you trust me, men. He said, you, it's going to start this week because a lot of you guys sitting in here, I'm not going to tell you who, but your coaches will let you know by the time Saturday rolls around. And we had, at that time, Oklahoma was coming up. He said, you know, that's going to be some of you guys that are going to start. And he said, you don't worry about that score. You don't worry about anything because I can assure you, if you do what I say and I get another class like you, I'm responsible for that one, this one, the next one, and by time I get me three more classes that I recruit like I got you, by time you get to be a senior, you're going to play with the championship. But I said that story to say that he he knew it. He saw it. He just had to build it. So he took a leap of faith against Oklahoma, third game, after going five and six, after losing. I mean, that was our first year. I'm sorry. Um, I'm jumping. But um, after losing, 47 and nothing and it was a it was a long road i started that next week against oklahoma it was uh, about five or six of us i probably know them because um we're all sitting in the front row of our senior pitcher and just like he said it now it was a long hard journey believe me but you know <laughs> from that moment in that office to my final game four years later in the orange bowl undefeated. Now, if it was a movie, we would have won the championship and been pulled off like Rudy or something, but we didn't win that <laughs> game. <laughs> we didn't win the first one. But we battled hard, and we fought, and we did all the things that uh, he wanted us to do. And so when you look back at the run he had, what he was saying is that recruiting means everything. I inherited this team. But I got to go out and get the players. So by him starting to reach up into Virginia, he found some talent. Okay, and now look at what they're doing. There's a lot of great players that we get out of areas that are not Florida. Florida's loaded with athletes. But he started to um, um, expand the program, the recognition. He wanted the national stage. I don't think you just get things in life. You got to visualize them. And Bowden taught us that. And, 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 and that's what we got. We got the ability to go out and we played Oklahoma. I remember the butterflies in the stomach. I looked up. I've never seen so much red in my life. But there's one thing I remembered more than anything. I think we lost, I don't know, 24, 17 or something. It wasn't like we got blown out and they were like number one or two in the country. They were like the premier program. And I still remember playing my tail off, doing everything I could, and really being upset about losing that game. But knowing that we, we didn't get blown out, that was for sure. And what I learned is that, that Midwestern values and how much football meant out in Oklahoma, 
they gave us a standing ovation as we left that field because, you know, that's what we need. Even when you lose, but you play that hard and you play that well, then somebody out there is looking at you and respecting you, and that's what Bowden did for us. He told us we belong. It's going to happen. It might not happen overnight, but if you do like I say, and I continue to get the guys like you guys, and he, you know, I'm not talking about – athletes only i got my grades up i graduated on time i mean he, he he recruited character guys we wore suits back then on the road i we we, we we took pride in being men and he developed that um and he and he taught us that if you work hard and you know what you want i'm in the same boat as you guys i got run out of west virginia he wasn't ashamed about it. He thought he had done a great job, and as soon as he started losing, they ran him right out of there. And he knew what it felt like to, 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 to lose. So when you come five and six, that was he did something, but he hadn't done enough. And he did some things at that time frame. We're talking mid-70s. I wasn't really understanding it then, but I do now. Uh, you know, it was it was it was a big change in uh, football in the South to play um, as many of us as he did I, on that side of the field. There was like, okay, if you're gonna put that many guys of that color on that field, you better win. Nobody talks about that, but that was a big change in the way football was being done. It's not a, you know, it, 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 it's crazy to talk about it now, but it was the mid seventies. And so he took a chance because he knew I got to get the best athletes and, and on this field. And at that time, we, we stayed in school for, for four years. So you got to develop your craft. You got to learn what you could do. And you, he had to step up there because I think he felt that this was a make it or break it for him. If he came in with a losing record again, who knows what would have happened. But because that season ended up being what it was it's still 35 years with all the success he's had he still can say that was my favorite team because that's when he knew he had what it took to be coaching he knew he had the athletes and he knew he was going to only get better because we had proven and he had proven to us that what he was teaching we were buying it that we were the players and it, it gave us the confidence to carry that into where we are and where that program is today. It was just one of the most gratifying, greatest things that you could ever be a part of. And to witness it and be a part of it from day one, it'll never leave you. It defines you. Wow. What a great story. Bob, mm -hmm. one, uh, one quick one for Walter before we let him go. Yeah, quickly, just more about Bowden, Walter. I could talk all day about him. We think about college coaches who are, just tuned in with one school. I mean, you talk about Paterno and Bowden. I mean, and you can go to guys like Frank Broyles and Partigian, but those two right there put you know, my indoctrination to Florida State football, Walter. I went to the kickoff classic in the 80s at the Meadowlands, and I'm in the stadium, and I'm looking in the parking lot, Walter, and I see about 10 buses pull up, and it's all Florida State fans. Walter, they get out of the bus doing the tomahawk chop, and it was rabid. They enter the building. They keep doing it, and that place rocked like I never saw how a team traveled like that to a place uh, a couple thousand miles away almost. It was just incredible, and it, it's all, it had a Bowden's, Bowden's signature on that entire program, how big it got over the years and uh, I wanted to get your opinion on him more about his coaching it's, we knew how great a recruiter he was but how about his uh, in-game managing and things like that Walter was he more of an offensive defensive guy and what were some of his great qualities motivation he, uh, hmm. accountability but I think for sure um, um, he was more of an offensive coach we used to um, we had a great defensive coordinator. Um, I know Mickey Andrews is one of the greatest. But in the early years, we had a guy named Jack Stanton that ended up coaching for quite a while and in, in the pros and everything. And um, Bowden really pretty much, well, I think they nicknamed him the Riverboat Gambler back then. He had all the <laughs> statue and all that stuff going on and reverses. Um, but his actual on-field, was probably more um, offensive because that was just 
his nature, but he also knew and respected and appreciated the defensive side of the ball. He had great coaches. Man, did they work us. We, I, I'd, I'd say we worked twice as hard. We'd, we'd come off the practice field and Bowden was always kind of nice and chummy and he was a good politician and all that stuff. And he would come out there and the offense would be already in. They'd already taken their shower. They'd already eaten and we'd still be out there on that field because Jack Hedden was making sure we did everything. And then Bowden would come out there and, he would say, let him go, Jack, let him go. Well, we knew good and well he knew what was going on, but he, he just, you know, he just, um, you know, always was motivating and he was a quite a bit of a, um, um, even in the locker room, he was a politician. He, I, he knew who could play football. I remember when I was a freshman, I, I mean, I literally walked around with a, with a, with a growl frown on my face the whole training camp. I mean, I did, I was a take no prisoner type of guy. And the coach, I didn't know if they recognized me or not, if they knew I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, and especially Bowden, a guy who really is above it all. He'd get on his, you know, uh, tower up there, and he was most offense, and you don't even know if he still knows your name. And one day I'm in line, and um, he goes, Walter why don't you smile? <laughs> he said, I said, well, you know, coach, I'm, you know, he said, you can smile around here because you can play football. And I, that meant everything to me. I was like, that man mm-hmm. notices me. He knew that, you know, he didn't tell me to smile to smile. He was just saying something to me to let me know that he had recognized the fact that I could play football. And you can get that from your position coach. You can get that from anybody else that's close to the program. But when you hear it from the man, it let me know that he was paying more attention to what was going on than I thought up in that tower. But all he really on the, um, as far as his X's and O's and as far as him getting really involved and getting in stances and all that stuff, he was offense. And he yeah. also used to tell us all the time, do not worry if we're down, don't you ever worry. You just keep playing football and you keep doing what you're doing because our offense, he used to say, it, we can score quick. So you can be down three touchdowns, and there were times we were. He said, but bang, 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 we'll be back in this thing. You know how he talked. And so we believed mm-hmm. him. So we just kept fighting. And one time I remember one game our senior year because we went undefeated, and we were down three touchdowns. And that clock hit fourth quarter. We were playing in Cincinnati. They had no business beating us. We were out there just kind of going through the motions, and they were jacked up. It was a little small stadium, 35,000 or so, and we were coming into the big time. And so all of a sudden, we down three touchdowns on the road. We don't even look like the team that was ranked nine and all this stuff, and we're getting ready to blow it all. And it was like all of a sudden this switch came on, and all we thought about was what Bowden had told us, bang, bang, we could be back in this thing. So that defense went in there, we shut them down, and I remember the coach saying, you know what, this is like two different teams. If you look at these first three quarters, you just see 11 guys. They're all just doing their job, but there's no emotions. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. We're not scoring. We got this team, and all of a sudden, it's like Cinderella. That clock hit fourth quarter, and we so we got to get – and all of a sudden, it's like a whole new team. They were the same numbers, the same players, but that sense of urgency, that Bowden, bang, bang, came into play. Mm-hmm. You stop him, we're going to score. Bam, he scored. He says, you go do it again. We do it again. We're going to score. Bang, he scored. And then the next thing you know, he said, wow, whatever he's been saying, it's true. Bang, bang, we can get right back in this thing. And we walked out of there with a win. And, um, you know, and so you can't help. You can believe him or you can live it. I believed him and I lived it. He did everything he said he was going to do. We did what he he expected us to do, and he continued that throughout his entire career. And and then the other thing I'm just, you know, to make a change from what you're talking about, Joe Paterno and, 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 and any, any of the great coaches out there, you, you see if any of them ever got it right. How long does it take you to find the right guy after you lose a guy like Bowden? Or look at Penn State. Look at Texas. Look at all these schools. Mm-hmm. Nobody found that replacement. I mean, you don't hit that home run. Nobody, everybody tried coaching waiting. Florida State got it right. 
Jumbo was the perfect guy for the perfect situation. It took a classy man like Bowden to understand what it takes to turn the keys over, and he got the right guy, and we still went into this day. It's just a tribute, again, to his legacy, because when he built it, he built it right, and that's why they're still there. Wow. What great stories, Walter. It's been fantastic just listening to you share your memories and share your stories. I wish we had more time, you know, to hear more of them. We hope you'll come back sometime and share share more of your thoughts, more of your insights. We know you got a lot of other things going on. We'd love to have you come back again real soon. We hope you will. I think you can tell. You call me, I'll talk. So just let me know. <laughs> I enjoy it a lot. Great. <laughs> That's great stuff. Okay, Walter. guys. Thank you so I tell much you what, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Anytime. All right, Thank Walter, you. Take care. All the best to you and your okay. family. You too. Thank you, sir. That is uh, former F- Florida State uh, defensive end, and he uh, played some time in the NFL with the Bucks, and then in the USFL with the uh, with the Tampa Bay Bandits, also some time with the Raiders. But Walter Carter, what a great what what great stories, Bob. I love the. The enthusiasm and the passion in his voice and uh, to hear his stories, that's fantastic stuff. Yeah, uh, it, it gives you goosebumps if you grew up uh, watching the Florida State. And, and you know, when you think about it, Chris, I mean, if you're from the east, it was Penn State. South, it was Florida State. As far as uh, having godlike figures at the helm and uh, to see what those guys did with two programs, it, it's just mind-boggling how they – continue to do what they do today because of those two guys. Um, it, it's just amazing, and we can go on all day about the Florida State program. And it just blew my mind when they came up to here to New Jersey that day. And that's when I first realized this is not just college bet football. It's big business, and uh, it, it's been like that since. Yes, absolutely right. I agree. All right, folks, when Bob and I come back, we'll be turning on the Thursday Night Tailgate Spotlight on the Positive. Hear which players are doing great things in their communities. We'll do all of that. We'll wrap up the show, and we'll do it on the other side of these words from our friends over at Kyvin Foods and the Salt Creek Golf Retreat. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcon tight end, and I'm the owner of Kyvin Foods. And if you enjoy delicious food, you're going to love my Kyvin products, which consist of our honey apple salsa, sweet barbecue sauce, and an array of seasonings. For store locations, online orders, and recipes, check out our website at www.kyvan82.com. That's K-Y-V-A-N 82.com. One taste, and you'll appreciate the goodness. If you're looking for a great place for your annual golf outing, a weekend golf getaway, or just a round of golf with your buddy, then Salt Creek Golf Retreat is just what you're looking for. Centrally located in Nashville, Indiana, just south of Indianapolis and west of Cincinnati, this challenging but fair 18-hole golf course appeals to all skill levels, and its scenic views of rolling hills and tree-lined fairways are sure to make golfing memories for years to come. Owned and operated by former Purdue and New York Giants fullback Randy Manier, Salt Creek Golf Retreat offers stay and play packages that include golf and a fully furnished one or two bedroom condo. After your round, be sure to stop by the 19th Hole Sports Bar and Restaurant for great food, fun, and drinks. Randy and his staff will treat you like family. For more information, log on to saltcreekgolf.com. That's saltcreekgolf.com. Or give them a call at 812-558-5944. Salt Creek Golf Retreat. Start making your golfing memories today. Thursday Night Tailgate, where the spotlight is always on the positive. Tune in Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time to hear your favorite NFL legends, players, and coaches sharing their stories. Now back to Chris and Bob. I wouldn't joke about anything else that happened to you tonight. And we are back here on Thursday Night Tailgate, and we are turning on our spotlight on the positive. Bob, who do you have for us this week? Chris, I want to give a shout-out to the entire San Francisco 49ers organization. I think it went under the radar screen a little bit that last month they received the uh, Sports Humanitarian Team of the Year Award. Uh, That's an ESPN-type thing. 
Chris, along with Bristol Myers. They do a lot of um, uh, honoring of teams, but they were picked, Chris, out of, and this is not just in football. This is from every sport. Uh, some of the finalists this year were uh, the uh, Memphis Grizzlies, the Chicago White Sox. So it's from different sports. And uh, out of all the sports, the 49ers won the award, Chris. And what that gave them, they, they get a $100,000 grant from ESPN that can be used toward uh, the various charities that they deal with. But uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's deep-rooted. It goes back to the, the, the Bartolo family, uh, what they've done in the uh, communities. But uh, what blew my mind, Chris, I'm doing a little research into that, the 49ers in uh, last year, Chris, they donated over 1,200 hours uh, of volunteer time. This is the team and, and, and representatives to 75 different events, uh, which which ended up raising over four million dollars for nonprofit things. That's just in one year they did, and uh, they're very involved with a couple different things. The two main things are the STEM Leadership Institute. That's something that that seventh grade kids up to high school can participate in. It's uh, it's for high level kids and um, it's just an amazing program. And then they had something called the STEAM Education Program. This is for K through eight kids. Uh, they uh, have reached over 150 thousand kids since that's inception. It's a free of charge, and that's uh, it, it's just an amazing thing they do to keep kids on track. And they usually end up graduating very, very high people. I think the STEM Leadership Institute, uh, half of them, Chris, had GPAs uh, at 3.8 or above. So uh, they're doing incredible things. They're very, very involved with uh, the, the Play 60 program. That's, of course, we've talked about that before. That's to get kids to go outside and play 60 minutes each day. They're on to that. And uh, they just do a lot. Uh, things like that, volunteering in the community. But tonight it's all about their entire organization, Chris, because uh, it, it happens yearly with this crew. And uh, it, and, and it's well-deserved that they were awarded by ESPN. But that is an incredible award that uh, I think went under the radar screen. So we're giving them the shout-out tonight. There you go. Absolutely we are. That is fantastic stuff, Bob. And, Bob, this week I'm going to put the spotlight on now Tennessee Titans wide receiver Eric Decker and the foundation that uh, he and his wife uh, set up called Decker's Dogs. And their mission, Bob, is to improve the lives of U.S. military service veterans as well as mm-hmm. animals. And let me, let me tell you how they do both of those things. They help fund the rescue, care, and training of service dogs for military veterans who are returning home with physical disabilities and emotional challenges as well. And, and let me read you something from their website under their mission. As a supporter of Decker's Dogs, you are helping veterans in their darkest hours while also freeing a shelter dog, allowing it to have a second lease on life and supporting a veteran. Free Freedom Service Dogs work exclusively with rescue dogs, you know, that journeys from a shelter to becoming a service animal costs about $25,000 to get them trained up. And they have, through uh, through their foundation, they have funded eight dogs to this point, and they're working on several more. So, you know, kudos, Bob, to Eric Decker and his wife, Jessie, for the great things that they are doing, rescuing dogs, training them up to be companions, you know, as service animals for our wounded veterans that, like I say, are coming home, you know, whether they are dealing with, you know, some really horrible injuries that they, that they have suffered or post-traumatic stress disorder. I know, Bob, shelter dogs and taking care of them is something that's near and dear to your heart, you know, for both of us, you know, with, uh, you know, taking care of our veterans out there. And, uh, you know, we've been involved with several different military, uh, you know, organizations, you know, handling those sorts of issues. And kudos to Eric Decker and his wife for what they are doing to help, you know, not only shelter dogs, but also getting them trained up to help our uh, our wounded veterans. We've we've honored many people in this segment, Chris, but uh, that's right at the top of the list because when you think about it, he's saving dogs and probably people's lives at the same time uh, with that kind of service, and uh, it just doesn't get any better than that. Uh, the guy has always been like that uh, since when he was up here in New York. We uh, we used to hear a lot about it, and but um, kudos to both the. The 49ers and Decker, because uh, that's the favorite part of this sh- this show, Chris, and these are the things that need to be publicized more, correct? Absolutely right, and that's why we love doing the Spotlight on the Positive segment. All right, Bob, time for us to put a bow on this episode of Thursday Night Tailgate. Our thanks again go out to Gus Farratt. 
Tony Collins, Terry Hanready, Harvey Armstrong, and Walter Carter for joining us tonight. And like I say every week, Bob, uh, the best part of the night is getting to share my uh, Thursday nights with you, my friend. Oh, the same here, Chris. That was just, that was quite the show, and uh, those are guys that can talk, and that's what we like. Just sit back and listen, and great stories. That was that was a lot of fun. Yes, it was. All right, next week, who do we have scheduled to join us? Well, we're going to cross over sports to baseball and talk with a guy that's uh, near and dear to both Bob and my heart, and that's uh, former Red Sox in- infielder Rico Petroselli. We've always loved getting to spend some time nice. with Rico. Typically, we were doing it on uh, on the baseball side when we were doing View from the Lone Red Seat with our good friend Dave Radigan, but, uh, uh, you know, we've uh, walked away from that show, and, uh, you know, unfortunately that show ended, and you know, everyone kind of went off and did other things, but uh, it's great to be able to have some time with Rico here next week. Uh, plus, we'll also be talking with former Dolphins and Rams tight end Randy McMichael, another guy who's got a lot of great stories. Always a lot of fun spending time with Randy. Former Buck Center Randy Grimes will be making his TNT debut, so looking forward to catching up with Randy. Plus, of course, uh, Tony Collins is here every single week with us, so great, great uh, spending some time with Tony again next week. So, another great show lined up for you folks next week. We hope you'll come back and be a part of it with us. I want to remind you how you can follow us on social media. First, on Facebook, we've got a Facebook page, Thursday Night Tailgate. Please check it out. Give us a like. That's important to us. Plus, Bob and I both have our own Facebook pages as well. Please also check out our uh, website, ThursdayNightTailgate.com. On there, you're going to be able to see who some of our future guests are going to be. Plus, you can stream or download any of our archive episodes from free from there as well. On Twitter, I am at CT Mascaro. Bob is at Bob underscore Lazari, and the show is at TNT Podcast. You can also stream us for free over with our good friends over on TuneIn.com and on Podbean as well. We really appreciate all the support the great folks over at Podbean have uh, given to us, recommending us as a as a show right there on their uh, sports and recreation section. Uh, you can also find us on their mobile app as well. Take us anywhere you're going. You can hear our show, stream it right uh, from your smartphone. Bob, take us home, my friend. Okay, Chris, I look forward to next week. That sounds like a lot of fun. And thanks tonight to our announcer, Joe Lajanusa, for the great job he always does with our weekly intro and ads. And to James Brocato and all the guys from Painted Faces for the upcoming outro music. On behalf of myself and Chris, to everyone tonight for listening, we appreciate you the very most. And until next week, good night, Kevin. We miss you.